comprehensive program prepared for you for the second inspiration days after a long break due to COVID-19. So this is the second time that we are hosting the inspiration days after um, uh, 2021. My name is Bruno Walter. Uh, I had the honor of organizing and now hosting the inspiration days. And I wish all of us to have uh, interesting events, 15 interesting presentations and panel discussions that will give us an insight into tourism, the future of Alpine tourism, but also on big data, which is becoming ever more important, buzzword AI. Then, of course, we will speak about sustainability as well, a topic that will be with us for the next years and decades to come. And last but not least, tomorrow morning we will speak about innovation on the mountain. Jake Falkner will present his visions to us. So we have a wide-ranging program prepared for you. I will keep silent for a moment. I would like to ask the organizer of Interalpin, Stefan Kleinlercher, to join me on stage to welcome you officially. Stefan, the floor is yours. Ah, what a charming host. Thank you very much, Bruno, for organizing this. So I think this deserves a warm round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. On behalf of Director Meyerhofer, um, who is uh, opening a Congress over at the Congress Center, uh, luckily we have uh, several events that take place in parallel. For example, the OITAF over in uh, the Congress Center of Innsbruck. I would like to uh, represent him today, and on his behalf, I would like to thank all the sponsors. The, this is the sequence of what we started in 2019. It's a great pleasure that we are having the Inspiration Days again this year. I would like to thank the keynote speakers. Eduardo, uh, thank you very much that you have traveled here from Brussels. We are very happy to have, to have you here. And I think this shows the quality of our event, as do the other keynote speakers and presenters of this event. A warm welcome once again at the Interalpine Trade Fair here in Innsbruck. I wish all of you a great success, interesting days, and insightful conversations. Thank you very much. All right, let's start right away. I would now like to ask the keynote speaker of the Inspiration Days to join me on stage, Dr. Eduardo Santander, CEO of the European Travel Commission. Eduardo, servus, a warm welcome. But we'll keep continue in English. Uh, have met Eduardo anyhow in in the past because he studied in Tyrol, so you have to be careful. Don't shout at him in German. He understands it perfectly well. Uh, but we decided to, to do it in English. And also, what we are doing is uh, it's not a presentation with a, with a few slides. There will be a few slides, but we decided to do it in a kind of free side talk. That means I allow myself to raise one or the other question, and Eduardo will give his input. But Nevertheless, and uh, outmost, the really content is coming from Eduardo. Once again, thank you to have you with us. Starting with your presentation uh, is basically the, the title Tourism in Europe, Status and Future. What's, you, what's happening? So, Eduardo, tell us a little bit how you see the actual situation in uh, tourism in Europe, recovery, etc., etc. Well, thank you. I also I would like to thank the organizers uh, of the Congress Messe Innsbruck, Bruno yourself, and all the sponsors and everybody present here. And I think this event has been live streamed. I see also Vilma over there. Vilma, long time no see. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be back in, in my little town, Innsbruck, where I had the big pleasure and honor uh, to live for 12 years and studied here. So, and my heart still in Tirol. And I see also Karin Seiler here from the Tirol Raven. So. Uh, thank you, Karim, for coming. I think you're doing a great job. And, um, you know, people feel very much magnetized by this uh, region. And from my first hours yesterday here in the, in the fair and, you know, just meeting with 
some of the um, sponsors and some of the um, exhibitors here, you see that there's a vibrant business. And it's not only about money, you know, I've, I've seen for the first time, you know, a lot of, um, let's say, there is greed, there is need uh, for transformation, there is need for regeneration, and people are just not only talking about it, but they are doing something. And this is what I would like to maybe start with, this, you know, like, um, I remember when I was still living here in Tyrol, there was like a, a nice opening speech from famous um, uh, Tyrolian actor, Tobias Moretti, who said, Van is genug, genug. Huh? When is enough, enough. And that's not so long no. ago, so I think it's about 10 years ago, and paradoxically, we are still talking about the same thing. But it's, I think it's time to walk the talk. And exactly. walking the talk is much, this is not an stumptish for, we are over, over, over and over can discuss over the same things but doing nothing. I think from a European level, what we see and what we notice um, that we have two choices now. We can be the change we want to see or we can wait to be regulated. We saw it during pandemic, it's very easy to close down, it's very easy to say, okay, you cannot travel, and that may happen again, but in a different way. And another question that I would like to, to raise today during um, my chat, my fire side chat, there's no fire, but um, is whether tourism is becoming um, slowly a privilege or it should remain a right and something that is so inherent to actually to European citizenship, it's so in our DNA. Huh? Please remember that Europe is still counting as the definitely first destination worldwide. But here is the question. First in what? First in overnight, first in expenditure, first in bed nights, blah, 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 blah. Or best? Best is a different question because you know that we have to talk about com a completely new set of an array of um, new key performance indicators that probably are not so easy to get. And exactly here, the Alps is the best lab to explore where the future of tourism in Europe is going to be going. After that introduction, Eduardo, tell me, and maybe all have heard European Travel Commission. What it's all about? What is European Travel Commission? What is you, Eduardo, what is ETC representing? I'm just a self of Rome. <laughs> A servant of Rome. No, um, the European Travel Commission is a very old institution. Uh, we're based in Brussels now, but that wasn't the case. You know, like we've been in, v in Vienna at times, we've been in, in, in Paris. I think we're based in Brussels for a simple reason to be close to the um, policy making and in decision making process and where we can influence also things that matter. Um, the European Travel Commission was founded back in 1948 as part of the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan, for those that remember it or have read about it, for the younger one was practically the catalyst for the uh, economic growth um, in, in Europe after the Second World War. And believe it or not, uh, some very wise men and women, there, was, there, there were already two women in that first round in, nine, in 1948, they were already talking about that, that tourism should be a catalyst for peace see Ukraine right now, what is going to happen after, after that. Remember right. the Balkan right. War and how yeah. many of their destinations today, like Croatia, like Slovenia, so are top on, on the list of uh, um, uh, travel wishes uh, nowadays. And they also thought that tourism can be a bridge also uh, to create more European cohesion, you know, to start a dialogue between countries that fought a war before. Um, and now, while we are not fighting, we're also fighting still for resources, we're fighting for visitors, uh, for economic growth, and uh, definitely you know, fighting climate change. Um, we define our work um, in three fields of expertise. We do a lot of market research, which is available to you all. Uh, you know, we decided five years ago that this is absolutely for everybody. I think um, it's so important to disseminate knowledge nowadays. We do marketing. Our role is to market Europe outside of Europe, and we want to create an image of Europe that it does only, not only reflect on uh, where or what should be visiting, but why are you visiting these places? And in that kind of triangle, visitor, um, people living in the places, and entrepreneurship, 
we have a huge issue there, right? Absolutely. And this, you know, this is that with the tensions that we have um, in the Alpine region, so where you know, see, um, people are asking themselves, uh, when is enough enough? You know, when the road is closed uh, by traffic and some of the valleys here Every suffer Saturday. heavily uh, in the winter season um, during the you know entry exit process of uh, of, of the holiday uh, blocks. Um, and we also do what we call advocacy. I call it lobbying. You know, lobby has maybe a little bit of a negative connotation, particularly in Brussels. But what we try is to create advantages for tourism and to mitigate these advantages. Things that have to do with connectivity. Things that have to do with accessibility of places. Things that have to do with travel facilitation. We saw yesterday, or I saw yesterday, I'm talking to some people here, how technology is becoming a a facilitator you know, to make a seamless experience since the arrival, you know, with uh, contactless tickets, uh, multimodal tickets, and so on and so over. Um, and last but not least, what we are is a platform of benchmarking. You know, we, um, together with the partners here in Austria, you know, the member of Austria member is the Österreich Verbund, the Austrian Tourism Board, but we have 35 other countries, and they sit, you know, on a regular basis together to. Uh, share best practices and also to benchmark among themselves. Because now it's not about competing, it's about you know, uh, uh, looking in the same together, direction to, to solve together. problems. Exactly. Brings us actually to, if it's working, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, a, tip, a, a logical question after three years after the pandemic, what's happening in Europe post pandemic? Where are we now? Have we fully recovered? What is happening with Eastern countries? because being a, a, a big source here in particular also for the Alpine re region. And last but not least, what's happening to our overseas travelers, which made, a, I would say, a significant portion before COVID to many, to particular regions in, in, in general. But if I remember figures correctly, 15% of the overnights in Europe, 25% from an economic point of view. So really massive figures. What is happening here? You know? Well, I mean, it depends who you ask, but in general terms, we are back to business. No? I mean, even here, you notice that despite, you know, the, uh, I'd say, difficult uh, climate conditions, uh, this winter, you know, uh, the winter was not so bad in the end, and in some places even with record um, numbers. Uh, we have to distinguish between, you know, intra-European tourism. Please don't forget that 85% of tourism happening in the EU it's intra-European. It's European people traveling into other European destinations. So like Germans coming to ski to Austria, you know, Austrian people going to Italy, or Spaniards going to Italy, and so on and so over. And we are back to numbers of 2019, definitely, and the prognosis for the, la for the next half of the year is that we're going to surpass probably numbers of 2019. So there's definitely a lot of appetite for traveling. Then we have the long haul, so visitors coming from outside the EU. And you know, don't forget that now we're counting also Britain as a non-EU country. We so, have to. <laughs> and there, you know, there's still a lot of room for recovery. You know, we see that we are still 16, 18 percent uh, below uh, 2019, but obviously we're still missing the Chinese. Chinese will come in the second half of the year. The US is back. The US is back with a lot of pent-up demand, a lot of disposable income, and with a completely new, um, let's say, profile of, of travelers. You know, the baby boomers are now very much retiring. Retire. They don't feel like taking a, a, a plane and sit for long hours on a plane. So and we are confronted with people that are teleworking, that are, you know, they, they can work while traveling in Europe. So it's a completely different, um, niche market. Set up, huh? yeah. And then, you know, like we heard from the Minister of, uh, um, I think it was Transport and Highways. I you know, like, from uh, India? Yes, the, India is, has such a, a potential there, uh, untapped. Um, India, I think it surpassed the population of China, of China I think, meantime, yeah. two weeks yeah. ago or a week ago. Um, and we see, you know, they are looking into um, European know-how um, to decongest um, their urban centers, uh, but also, you know, to try to develop sort of I think it's impressive when, you have, when we have heard yesterday that they are, in, are now spending five billion yeah. into, into rope infrastructure. This is pretty clear why I think the, uh, the minister is here. Definitely <coughs> India is the new China, exactly. if I may say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then um, 
something that is very important to understand is that European tourism runs on aviation. You know, something we cannot deny. And it's something that sometimes when uh, the media report about uh, sustainability and how tourism could change, we always for forget that you know, tourism is multi-sectorial. You know, and we are very heav heavily dependent on transportation, particularly air transport. And aviation is not doing very well right now. Aviation is uh, facing, while well, you know, they are reporting very good numbers, you know, the reality is that the, you know, their forecast for the next 20 years, are, it's gloomy. It's gloomy because they have to reach targets uh, due to the Green Deal of the European Union or the Fit for 55, where they have to um, reduce uh, their carbon footprint and become you know, even towards the net zero which is today still impossible, you know, with the technology that we have today. And this is where we have to be assertive here. There's not enough trains in Europe, and, no, you know, no, some no. places have not even train uh, railways. I mean, if you are in Innsbruck, well, you, you know, arguably you could say you can travel by train almost everywhere. But it depends. If you live also in Tyrol, in, you know, like in, uh, let's say, in Ötztal, but, but then, I don't know, in Gurgl, um, Arguably, you say, okay, if I would travel from Gurgl to Berlin, it's going to take me a good, uh, you know, a good how to do time it, huh? how to yep. do it. And, so, and but think yep. about also remote and peripheral <coughs> um, places like the Canary Islands, Malta itself, insular territories, and so on. So let's not fall into the trap of, oh, yeah, no, you know, everything is going to be. There's no enough trains or seats yet uh, to cater for, for the amount of tourists that would come to the Alpine regions or anywhere else. Um, and here is where we have to also support aviation in this kind of transition, you know, because uh, I think, and we'll talk about this, Bruno, because it's very yeah. important. Um, I talked to the um, governor of Tyrol yesterday about this, and to the to the mayor of Innsbruck about the how polarized, you know, our business has become, you know, how. Um, and I yeah, talked to the media, pointing, you know, I think yeah. that. Uh, the war media comes from mediate, right? The mediate between the public opinion and the facts. And now we see that in, a, in that mediation process, there's just polarization, it's just attack, you know, like uh, tourism against the envi environmentalist, and environmentalists against tourism. And this is not about this. And it's, uh, you know, we have to create this kind of dialogue platforms. Um, so tourism is doing well, still in a very healthy shape, coming back to the initial question. But let's take this with a lot of care. Because what we see is that, you know, like uh, um, the big deterrents of tourism are going to be finances in the next probably two semesters. With the inflation still uh, decently high for what we have seen in the last 10 years. And people are starting to scratch their pockets when they go on holiday. Yeah. Just as a personal anecdote, I was here on a family holiday skiing, ski holiday. And I noticed myself, you know, I have two children and, uh, you know, yes, uh, the difference between my last ski holidays with them and this year's holiday was exponential in terms of cost, in terms of exactly the same service. Um, ski rental, ski rental uh, in terms of ski pass, and uh, obviously accommodation. accommodation. So and my estimation was between 12 and 15 percent increase. Plus, now there is a trend to tax the user, you know, and say, okay, let's solve the climate uh, change issue, you know, by taxating. Think about it, then you start adding taxes, 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 a holiday becomes unbearable for many yeah, families. Absolutely. Hmm? Brings me actually to the next slide. Uh, fueling that thing, right now we are, I think, in a situation or in, 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 in a trend where revenge travel spirit is on. Uh, my question to you is basically, will it continue? It means, is it a long-lasting thing, or is it just something for, for the moment? And as you mentioned it already, or touch base already with that, will it be affordable in the future? To whom will it be affordable? And what could be consequences at the end of the day? It's a big question, Bruno. So I know. And, and, you know <laughs> I, I don't have the, the you know, concrete and absolute answer to your question, but, you know, We've done some research and some forecasts for the next two years. So, and intra EU, um, there is 55% uh, of the population in the EU planning a trip, uh, multiple trips between April and September this year, and then December and um, Easter of uh, 2024. Uh, uh, meaning that, of course, as people, you know, they're still willing to travel, and it's, it's, you know, it's a it's a matter of lifestyle, okay. you know. Let's start uh, thinking that you cannot tell people not to do things that they will 
exactly. uh, you know, people will like to save elsewhere, elsewhere in their lives, but they will not like to save on their holidays. And let's admit it, you know, to travel and to go on holidays is a hedonistic, egoistic, uh, you know, it's, it's something, an egoistic way. it's a treat, I mean, it's something new, no? it's like in, in German, no? it's, you, you want to treat yourself and you want to feel differently at least for a few days. And we are not going to deny the fact that we are asking, you know, the demand to take the responsibility of the supply. Something that says, okay, now you have to consume responsibly. You have to le use less water. You have to switch off the lights behind you. You have to think, okay, we have to validate that with a, a, what I call the value gap incentive. Why should people do these things? And, you know, we need yeah. to create an environment, the right environment um, to provide with. Um, rewarding points or any kind of discounts or whatever, so to incentivize people to change their habits. And this is a process of years. Now, yes. with regards to revenge, revenge is very much uh, tangible in long haul. Um, please don't forget that Chinese have been um, no, practically in prison yeah. yeah. uh, for almost, three years for three years now, so <coughs> and they are coming back. Uh, the forecast is 100, 120 million. Um, departures in okay. the in the second uh, half of the year. So be prepared and okay. start um, using your Mandarin so you, again. <laughs> you recommend to learn Mandarin at least, no? Definitely. <clears throat> what are the big deterrents again? Um, money is running out of the pockets of people, and there is problems with personal finances, with travel expenses, and inflation. As I said, good news for the Alpine regions is there is a huge still demand for natural landscapes uh, and you know less crowded areas. There is a lot of interest for green areas and, you know, get out of classic urban spaces and so on. The biggest losers of the pandemic were the cities, and it's still today, yeah. the big cities. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Innsbruck is not uh, noticing but that too much. But even here, I think we are still uh, a little bit suffering, but and not And you in see, and also in yeah. the... In, 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 long haul market that people are no longer so interested in the big tour, in the Paris, Barcelona, London, uh, Rome tour. Um, and now they are coming back into, you know, you know, I want to experience something. I want, so this, this is still an opportunity for the Alpine, uh, for the Alpine regions for sure, to position itself. Brings me to, to the next question, even a little bit provocative maybe. What's the outlook from your point of view for the, for the Alpine destination? Quality, is it quality above quantity? How do we deal with, with, with climate change? Not to forget, and you mentioned it already, the stakeholders, I think, is mm. something what we have to take uh, really seriously into consideration as we see a differentiation between the locals saying, do we need tourism? No, we don't. Nevertheless, we are all living from it. How do you see that? What are your recommendations in that? I'm a natural born optimistic, so I think the Alpine regions, uh, particular DACH, you know, Germany, Austria, and, and, and Switzerland, and Italy are actually in a very good position with regards to ranking. And, you know, we do this uh, travel sentiment index, and uh, the Alpine regions ranked top five still as, you know, like which, both summer and winter. So. Is when we talk about seasonality, and allow me to say that seasonality is not only a problem here. Eh? Seasonality no. is a problem in 96% of all European destinations. And that has to do with a lot of factors. We know that, you know, for instance, Germany has, uh, every Bundesland you know, has different um, uh, school vacations, but that's not the case in all, uh, you know, all over Europe. So it's not about you know, different seasons, snow, and, or you know, winter, summer. It's about also create the right policies, you know, to allow people to travel all year round. But sometimes we are still very much in a, a 19th century uh, mentality, where you know factories used to close in around the 15th of August, Ferragosto in Italy, right? And uh, you know we still traveling. There is this exodus north south um, in the months of July and August mm. to the same places creating bottlenecks, over trampling, and so. The good news, uh, Bruno, is that um, I think the Alpine regions are going to be doing much better than other regions in Europe. And uh, the big difference now is that demand is changing. And you know how agile also the supply is to change to this new demand. We see from this uh, research that we do that um, uh, demand is now driven by more subjective factors. It's not about what you have, what kind of landscape, how much snow, or you know, how many uh, leaves, uh, mountain leaves you have, but it's definitely priority of quality above quantity, obvious. Um, but there is this kind of, again, I call it the money, money time matrix, which is what tourism is about. 
how much time you have to travel and how much money you have in your pocket. And the problem is money is running out. And time, you know, when we thought that after pandemic we're going to be super flexible and, you know, we're going to be working from the ski resort and so on, <laughs> that's not crystallizing. Not, not yet. Uh, that's not crystallizing. <clears throat> and what we see also, like, in Brussels particularly, that people are being called back, you know, to nine to five and to warm their chairs in the offices. So um, let's con reconsider that from a regulatory framework too. Another subjective factor is that people are looking for season-free destinations, all, all year round offer, and uh, not weather dependent. You know, if you cannot ski, you should be offered something else before a cancellation comes uh, like offer or, uh, or, or, you know, or people are tempted to go somewhere else. Okay, there's no snow, go to the sun. Like, you know, we saw a lot of things this winter too, you know, that people had booked a ski holiday, they ended up in Egypt uh, over Christmas or yeah, so. Yeah. Um, and also the, the people are more conscious about the value base offer on, um, based on this relationship between visitors, territory, and residents. You know, they see that they are conscious about the tensions between you know, like tourism or tourists and locals. Mm. And this is something maybe in Tirol is, yeah, we see it, I, I talked to the mayor about the, the problem with the uh, real estate. In, around the capital of Tyrol, and you know, how it's becoming unbearable for uh, young people to, uh, you know, to live, to live here. Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, and this is not only the case in, in Innsbruck, but in many other places yeah. in Europe. And this is creating a problem of, cons uh, uh, let's say, of a social problem. Absolutely. And uh, it will not, uh, my forecast, and I don't want to be pessimistic now, is that there's not I think there's in a few years time we're going to be upheaval of people saying why, and you know we now how is it the the clever clima no clima clever clima clever uh, now uh, one day we're going to see someone um, gluing himself to a, a mountain lift and see what's happening no and then when that happens there's going to be a debate again and people will start yeah, thinking yeah, about yeah. it. We shouldn't create ideas by the way for those guys. No, <laughs> in general terms. We, we have created in Brussels, you know, I was talking to Gernot before about Brussels and everybody <coughs> refers to Brussels with something alien, you know, like, you know, I mean, Austria sits in Brussels too, you know, and they decide together with the other members and, you know, and regions in, in Brussels have a lot of power, by the way, more than the member states, something, particularly in tourism. Yeah. It's about creating better places to live than become better places to visit. To be. And I think we have forgotten that. You know, that while you create infrastructure, you have to think first about your population and your people, not about getting votes for the next elections, but also, you know, for a future. And there is a declaration that we create, you know, together with the United Nations World Tourism Organization. This is one better place to live, better place to visit. And, you know, I really uh, will invite, you know, entrepreneurships and, you know, institutional um, partners in Tyrol and beyond uh, to sign it because that has a compromise. You know, it's target oriented, it's measurable, it's tangible. Um, so, yeah, the outlook, coming back to your question, long story short, um, it's good. Fine. Good, good to hear. Maybe it's only good, the outlook, when we touch base on what has to be touched, sustainability. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned the EU, and I think many things are, are driven also, or will be influenced significantly by the green plan of the EU. I think, what, uh, what do you think about that? And uh, how can, for example, Artificial intelligence, intelligence, intelligence. Sorry for that. Uh, support that. Uh, what is your common impact or your common opinion on, 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 on sustainability in general? Provocative question from my side, if you allow me. Is CO2 neutral even possible? Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do we want to sustain? Sustainability as a word, as a basic word. What do we want to sustain? A, margin, profit-driven, very successful industry that has been um, exponentially creating opportunity for the last hundred years, or, and this is what it comes the or, <laughs> order, um, or do we want a transformative, regenerative, forward-looking industry. And this is what transformation comes in, in place and where people have, you know, the whole thing with the sustainability is not an engineering problem. It's a 
psychological problem that we have to change our lifestyle, and that's going to take time and costs. And here, um, you know, we are very much focused, particularly in the Alpine region, so because it's very visible. You know, when the you know um, you see the landscape, or also in other places like my home country in Spain, where you know there's no water as we talk. You know, there, it hasn't been raining for more than 100 days now. So imagine in Catalonia region and Andalusia region, that's a big thing. Uh, but here, uh, it's very much focused on the environmental factor. But you know, we should not forget the social dimension, the economic dimension, and the cultural dimension of, of tourism. Um, when we talk about um, sustainability, we have to come to very conclusive um, targets and things that I have summarized it in three, and, and allow me to use my notes, that there are three silos we have to work, but not separately interconnected. First of all, as it's mentioned before, travel, mobility, and connectivity. I think as long as we don't change our modes of moving around, because there's no tourism without you know, transportation, we are not going to achieve any kind of uh, you know, CO2 targets. Um, We've seen here, we've seen in the Interalpine that uh, digitalization is full ongoing, uh, and uh, also for control of flows. I don't know if you, many of you probably have been in Dubrovnik. They have a dig digital control of flows, of visitor flows, mm. that could be used also in some, you know, again, it's, you cannot compare Dubrovnik with uh, Tiledal. But the reality is the problem is the same. There is congestion some days uh, every week because people are coming in and out to a small place with one road or two roads. Mm -hmm. um, and how can we embrace uh, technology to also uh, inform people when they should be traveling and when not? The second point is, and this is where uh, Mr. Hurl yesterday was uh, very provocative, saying there will be 50 more years of skiing for sure. I mean, Hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> I hope he has a glass ball because I don't have it to, to, pro to give a, a number. I don't know if it's 50, 40, or 20. But the reality is we have an issue with the snow, no? and everybody knows that. But the problem is how are we going to preserve the environment and reduce the carbon, uh, the carbon footprint while maximizing the social impact of tourism? No? Because the problem is we don't want to say, OK, we have to close and there's no more jobs. You know, the value change of tourism, the spillover effect in the economy, the, you know, the bakery that provides bread to the hotel and the hotel employs 20 people that are coming from uh, local families and so on and so forth. This spillover effect of tourism goes, you know, it's multi-layer. Um, here, about the net zero targets, um, uh, biodiversity, circularity, um, so on, there's so many European programs. But we have to agree on a standard. The problem is, you know, if today uh, Innsbruck would arguably say we are the most sustainable um, uh, tourism destination in the Alps, nobody can contest yeah, that. Say, yeah. you know, how do you measure that? I say, you know, we, you know, we measure water consumption, energy consumption. Uh, we ask our visitors how they feel about um, when they visit. We are, we ask our locals. But then, you know, tomorrow. Uh, another city would come, we are the most sustainable, and they measure completely different. So they are comparing apples with pears. And we have to start comparing apples with apples. Mm? And, and this is where we, at, uh, in, at the Euro at European uh, level, is where we have a little bit of a competence. This is where we should unify uh, criteria when it comes to measure. And last but not least about, about this question on sustainability is technology as, as this big enabler from, for transforming and innovate practices. Huh? It is no long time ago, it, <clears throat> imagine, we were very, very, very active when it comes to the digital COVID certificate. You know, at ETC we work relentless lobbying the institutions to create a QR code that was existing already 15 or 20 years ago. Coming back, yeah. uh, and all the same for please. At, at least the EU countries, uh, and then everybody adopted, starting Israel, US, even, you know, uh, everybody adopted the, the same format of DCC. But I can tell you how many hours, long hours in the night cost us, you know, to convince them that that was the right thing to do, even to a me members that said that they wanted to provide their own technology. No, we don't want a different system, we want just one system. And this is the same, you know, with tourism. We have to create certifications, labels, and standards that are equal, that are the same for Austria, for Slovenia, for Finland, or for Malta. Because otherwise, you know, we are going to always talk about rankings and 
quantification rather than qualification. And this is where tourism is transforming. We, people are not willing to count tourists. They want to tell them. This is the question, Bruno. Remember, we were talking last night. It's not about you should travel less. It's says you should travel better. Exactly. But then the, the tourist asks you, how do I travel better? How do I travel better? Right. Exactly. Brings us to logically touching base already on sustainability. What kind of time for climate action is now in tourism? Maybe starting on the question, are we, is tourism, and in particularly alpine tourism, a victim of the climate change? Or can it even be benefiting from the climate change? What are the key challenges? And again, will tourism in the future not be affordable anymore <coughs> due to the many regulations we will see? I ask myself as an individual, as a traveler, and I travel a lot, unfortunately, something so I shame myself, you know, like you know, the amount of hours I spent uh, on planes and airports. Um, but tourism has both the responsibility and also the opportunity. And we should not deny that we're part of the game, but so is our agriculture, or yeah. so is, you know, like uh, automotive habits. industry. Yeah. But what we're doing, we're great in pointing, you know, the others, you are more, you're more. It doesn't matter if we're, you know, we are. Underneath it all, we are only 3% of the, of the CO2 emissions when it comes you know, to, to the global um, warming. So it's not so much on the, in the number, but you know, it does a little bit. And yeah. Unless we start from, uh, to protect resources, natural environments, wildlife, and you know, also livelihoods, because sometimes we think about the, the planet is going to be fine without us, but probably will have to disappear for the planet to regenerate, and we don't want that. No, it's about humanity. It's not even about the planet. The planet sh should be probably completely fine. Listen, it is scientifically possible to halve emissions by 2030, half okay. of them. The question is if we want it or not. And this is a very difficult question to ask for a small and medium-sized enterprise. And you know that in Tyrol, particularly, that the majority of entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs here are family businesses, are little B&Bs, are uh, micro-enterprises, like a little ski rental in a small ski resort, and so on and so on. People that really need to understand um, that it's the change has to come also with a kind of tool, you know, given this is where um, regulation and where governments can be uh, scrapping boats rather than with ideology and populism, but with tools. Tools are digital tools, program uh, grants, really providing trainings, upskilling people. We've been all over Europe. In Tyrol is a problem too, you know, that they, there's not enough people willing to work in tourism. So why should you work in tourism? Exactly, yeah. You know, everybody says, oh, this is, is a waiter's business. Yeah. Is it interesting? Well, people <clears> forget <throat> about, you know, that you know, there's also hotel management, there is also, you know, uh, uh, NTOs, there is regional tourism organization. Tourism is so vast when it comes, you know, but everybody focuses on the, you know, on the gastronomy, on the very heavy jobs and so on. How do we not only attract people, because attract people is not so complicated, but retain them. Retaining has to do with motivating them economically, of course, you have to pay fair. And, not, you know, it's not only more, it's fair. Secondly, you have to train them, and then you have to give them reasons to stay with upskilling them. The world is changing, and people need new skills. We are so stupid in tourism. We train people. We give them the best. We give them languages. We give them account accountability, knowledge. We give them a lot of responsibility, and then what they do? Once they have saved a little bit, they, they, go, the they yep. go to the next sector and abandon tourism forever. And then we start from scratch again. And what is happening now is that we even have to import people from all over the world, you know, to, to work on the glaciers, or to work on the, um, on the huts, and, and so on. And this is where also the quality started to suffer, mm -hmm. no? And this is where, you know, the debate of an authenticity, and this is very tangible in Austria, where authenticity, no? And this is uh, one of the really words that uh, Austrian Jena, but Alpine regions, you know, have been um, um, spreading to the war. You, know, you come here to have a very, very particular experience. You know, you want to see the, the real thing. Huh? You don't want to have the, uh, the fake uh, ski resort in Dubai or, uh, you know, or uh, any of that. You want the real thing. And here we, we need to be, again, super assertive. Uh, this is an investment that it starts in, in the primary school. Educating uh, children, and 
allow me to, to tell that ETC is doing now a project with the University of Surrey in creating even, um, you know, there are, I have two small children, and there are books that say you should become a doctor, you should become a fireman, you should become this and then the other, but nobody talks about any tourism jobs there. Okay. And we are doing yeah. with them, um, I cannot reveal the, the name of the author because it's very famous, a British author that is writing a book for the first time for children to stay working in tourism, to okay. start developing an interest. Because it, it, it's the grassroots that, 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 you know, here in Tirol, obviously, if I was born in a, in a Bauernhof, no? in a farm, and, uh, you know, I saw the whole thing, and, you know, I, I can transmit that authenticity. But this is not happening. There is no demand coming. You know, children are not skiing any longer. You know, there is not that. When I was a child, I was sent to a white week, it was called in Spain, you know? Carnival holidays and Easter holiday was gold season. You, know. you know, we have to subsidize the ski resorts are doing a, a, an, an effort in subsidizing tickets for families, having children for free and so on. But it's never enough. Because at a certain point, maybe Mr. Hurley saying 50 years, maybe it's possible, but maybe there's no people making cues yeah. in the ski lift. Right. Irana, as I have as moderator, to yeah. look a little bit on time, Sorry. <laughs> I skip one and ask those questions later on and go basically to, to the last slide with a simply provocative question. Alps, what's the way forward? Or in other words, what can we do better from your point of view, from ETC's point of view? I'm going to allow myself, and I, I hope I don't sound patronizing, but to give you a little recipe. And it's not coming from me. You know, we sat for over eight months. I'm part of the advisory council of the World Economic Forum. And we have created a recipe for destinations, you know, of 10 ingredients that you need to put in your pots and start cooking differently. First, is to certify and monitor scientifically. You cannot say things because you think they are right. You have to uh, peer review your results with two different sources. You say, okay, if your ski resort arguably is really um, using um, renewable energy, if the water in a golf course is really thin, you have to demonstrate that it's that. It's really true. And then you have to put it in your also uh, sort of certificate in your marketing plans, because that's what people want to say, that you are really saying the truth. Second, and I mentioned that, cultivate the workforce. This is a people's industry. Nobody will travel if there's no people serving you. It's an ox to say that a robot will, or artificial intelligence will substitute, you know, like a, I don't know, I'm Pechta of the, of, of the Alp, no? It doesn't work like that, you know? No robot can do um, the job. Then I mentioned also prioritized communities. People are starting to be tired. And it's not tired about tourism. It's tired to see that they don't profit from tourism. Because they don't, first, they're not explaining how tourism is enriching their lives. And second, they're not involved in the dialogue. There is a very good uh, example in the city of Bruges in Belgium, the Venice of the North. And they asked people, because they were, you know, people are starting to have demonstrations and say, we don't want more tourists, we cannot park our cars, we cannot, you know, there are no supermarkets, there are only souvenir shops. Um, and they developed this new um, um, approach of tourism marketing involving the locals and having them in the stamp dish, in mm -hmm. the table, no? uh, having also an opinion and a vote. Second, in, uh, fourth ingredient is align visitors. visitors have to be also educated. You know, people buy from a shelf. It's like going to, to the supermarket, you know? As long as there is a, you know, cruise line for 5.99, people will buy it. So we have to redefine how we place our products and whether that's still at, you know, at your eyesight or it's down, it's, it's a niche. Hmm? Low cost, cheap. Protect heritage and nature, pretty much thing. We focus a lot of environment, but heritage, you know, I was talking um, to the rector of MCI, mm -hmm. and you know, I've it's learned from I've learned from the Dogan, I just, and you know, the, the cultural um, background. That's also, you know, obviously the um, let's see the the main drive for people to come to Rome may be the nature, but that doesn't mean that there's no lot of cultural heritage here. No, uh, you know, um, 
starting with yeah. the capital city, but exactly. also in the villages and yeah. so on. Um, um, produce and consume yeah. responsibly, that's pretty obvious. obvious. Calibrate infrastructure. A new, a new lift to eagles. I think there has been like uh, some question to the um, uh, local population. Exactly. Yeah. Um, for me, fantastic idea. Obviously, you know, like smart mobility. Um, it's, it's, it is it probably a thing. But you know, you have to calibrate whether Innsbruck needs it or not, and whether it's just a, a toy to have or not. I mean, and here you have, I say, it's the lab because I think Innsbruck had the first cable call from the city to the mountain now with the Norket mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And this is the most difficult one, govern effectively. <laughs> Sitting with Georg last night on hour, you know, it was fun conversation because, you know, obviously uh, politics is short-lived, uh, but, you know, new generations will look at us and say, why didn't you vote for the right people, you know, saying that, and I'm not advocating for you to vote in one direction or the other, that's not my role. But I say that, you know, we have to come to conclusions here that if we don't do anything, from nothing comes nothing. And then we'll be talking about over and over the same in yeah. maybe 50 years time. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. And the last but not least, Bruno, I know we're running out of time, is embed resilience. We have passed a festival of crisis. We're still doing one, by the way, you know, with the whole uh, financial still very shaky. And we have to build um, destinations, we have to build infrastructure, we have to build um, marketing programs also, thinking about that nothing will last forever. And say, you know, like in mm -hmm. Tirol, it, you hear always, es geht uns sehr gut. And, you know, Comfort that can also change. That can also change. And uh, uh, put resilience in your budget to consult with people. Then, and there are a lot of experts also in the room and say, you know, like, uh, what do we do if having a plan B, C, and D? And last one not least, and thanking you, um, Bruno, is um, because I'm a little bit sick of hearing about people prognosing the future. And, you know, I think nobody's got here to say what's next. But you know, it's, there is a quote from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, that's the author of The Little Prince, that probably everybody has read. It says, our role is not to forecast the future, but to shape it. Super. Eduardo, thanks very much for your words. Thank you. Big applause for you. I think it was more than interesting to hear on an international perspective what's going on, what threats, what are opportunities, what are challenges. I see you again, Eduardo, in the, the discussion round what we have. Once again, big applause for you. Thanks very much for coming. And take care and see you rather soon when we continue. And we continue now. And now, jetzt wechsle ich wieder zu Deutsch. Wir müssen aufpassen. Zu unserem zweiten Vortragenden, Access. I want to welcome our second speaker. He's from Access. We heard a lot about Access in the previous speech. His name is, uh, he's the CTO of Access. And he will tell us about um, how ski tickets on mobile phones can become a reality for us. Mr. Daniel Vakunek, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you for having me here. I'm looking forward. I'm from Carinthia, so I'm looking forward to presenting here in Tyrol. What I am presenting to you today is just a fraction of what I could tell you, speaking about challenging challenges or opportunities of tourism. So this is just a small part, a component, that only works if it is used in a correct way and placed where it actually belongs. It's all about digitalization and transformation of processes that we are using today to digital processes. So this does not seem to be working. Oh, now it is. Yeah. Yeah, sehr gut. 
Um, grundsätzlich hat die Firma Access mit dem Thema the uh, Access Company am Handy oder Handy, Sticker am Handy bereits 2020 already started working on Bluetooth, low energy on mobile phones in 2020. This is when I started working there as well. Actually, it was an impulse coming from the market and a demand from the market. People started saying, how cool would it be if we could switch from the classic ski ticket to a ticket on the mobile phone. Expectations were very high. This is, of course, much more comfortable for our guests. For the ski resorts, it is also an advantage because the media tickets are printed on are also a cost factor. Um, and if the guest has a ticket on their mobile device, this also saves costs. I think only speaking about costs, however, and cost savings, this is not the gist of, of the topic. So, in 2020, Access started with this project. We now have the third version. We are launching it on the market as we have it now. This year, um, and you can also visit us at our booth to get more information. BLE is a challenge. We are using technology that was not aimed at being used for this, precisely for this, to find out whether our guest is currently in the turnstile or where, wherever the guest is. The difference to a classical ticket is that the mobile phone communicates. It is not inactive at all. It is sending signals continuously. The ticket that we have right now only works in a turnstile because it needs to be read in the device. Um, so from a technical perspective, it is a challenge. Next thing is that our mobile phones are optimized masterpieces with battery performance that helps us get through the day. So everything I do with this device needs to be usable without affecting the battery too much, because if the smartphone does not um, want to want to be active anymore, um, we have to deal with this. We need to make sure that the battery level stays high. Yesterday, for example, I started with a full battery, and in the evening I still had 78%, um, and I used my phone over the day. So this was not a problem for me. The industry has certain expectations when it comes to such technologies. We have tickets that work very quickly. You don't even realize that this exchange of information is happening. So if you think naively, you would think this should be working with the mobile phone as well, but we need the right speed, connectivity, wireless, and so on. So these were the technical challenges. But we dealt with these challenges. So now the clicks from before worked. Effectively, we found a solution, a sustainable solution. Every access turnstile that people have bought in the past can also be upgraded with this. So we do not have to replace all the hardware. We developed an, an antenna that can be used for upgrades, but also for new devices, of course, for new hardware. So this, these gates can become BLE accessible. 
man braucht jetzt nicht irgendwo so upgrades are possible you do not have to throw anything away so how does it work for the ski resort operator it works basically like a classical ticket we did not want to transform all processes because this becomes an operative nightmare our guests can buy the tickets online as they often do today already so you get the link with the ticket that brings you to an app where it will be saved. It's like a barcode that you receive from the counter. If you buy several tickets, you get several tickets, of course, um, that can be scanned. And then you can save them all in a wallet. Of course, it could be that the phone, um, phone's battery runs low um, later in the day. For us, therefore, it was important to prevent this that the operator can tell the guest at the turnstile that the battery of the phone is running low and warn the person to replace the ticket. We, so the processes are being monitoring, are, be, are monitoring the battery status of mobile phones even. In the mountains, anything can happen. Maybe turns to go offline. The thing is, we have to make sure that this process is not becoming a nightmare for the guests. So we may have to make sure that the BLE is also working when the system is offline. For the guest, it is a bit more complex. The guest needs to buy the ticket. This is very simple. Then you have to share or transfer the ticket if you bought it at the counter. Of course, you can distribute the tickets. But if you buy in the online shop, you need to make sure that you use the links to get the tickets um, into your mobile wallet. So then you need to bring the tickets into your phone and load them into your wallet, and then you still have to activate a ticket. The chip card is um, RFID secure, but the barcode you can use or multiply no matter who you are. So you have to make sure that the ticket is loaded into the phone and connected and only can be used by you. And the ticket cannot be shared, so if there are any changes that are necessary, this has to happen through a counter. Then the smartphone needs to be placed anywhere on your body. The chip card you can wear anywhere, but the mobile phone will have to be in a certain position. For us, it's possible to have the mobile phone on the left-hand side, so anywhere in the chest or, or belly area, it's fine for the system to work. We do not need Wi-Fi. We don't need Internet. Once the ticket is active, you can use it anywhere. In a, for tourists, this is very important because roaming can be a problem for some. Or maybe there are there's no network connection in some ski resorts, so this is important. After entering the turnstile, the battery status can also be um, shown, so this is very interesting for the people. 
Wir haben da hinten eine kleine Demonstration, wie das Grundsätzlich aussieht. Here you can see what app, the wallet looks like. So you have this app that you can load the ticket into. Then you act, the guest activates and shares the ticket. The person receives active notifications when the battery level is running low and also notifications on the activity. It is supported by um, iOS 16 on the iPhones. I think with Android it's version 5, but I'm not really sure. Und wir schränken da die Androids nicht ein. Das ist auch ein Unterschied zu dem, was man So it works for Android perfectly as well. Für Bergbahnen, die ihre eigenen Destinations-Apps betreiben, Some ski resorts have their own destination apps. We will offer um, software device kit. I think this is challenging because this is where the digital transformation happens. This process helps not only saving costs but also digitalize everything. Some of the destination apps existing today are not very appealing. They need to be made very useful. And if they can use it in these ways as well, maybe the guests will register in those apps if the webshop is part of the app, for example. Um, yeah, the apps müssen aber native sein. Also man the apps need to be native. Of course, this makes it expensive for the operators. They need to develop these apps for Android and for iPhones, usually. This is a precondition because without these apps, the technology does not work. So what are the limitations for the guest? The speed might become a limiting factor. We have an average speed of around one second, which is quite acceptable. In the industry, a perfect access is um, is set at 500 milliseconds at the turnstill. If 100% of guests would switch to this system, and I th hardly believe that every child and every person um, has, the, has a mobile phone, but I don't think that will happen. Of course, this would um, lead to deceleration. But I am pretty sure that in the next couple of years we will be able to speed up the process and we will achieve the speed of the chip cars. We do not have any restrictions with regard to Android devices. We tested in several ski resorts and we processed more than 350 different Android devices or device types and we realized that most of them work perfectly with our technical approach. But there is, every once in a while there was a device with um, some problems. We are in a calibration process and trying to solve this. This is an intense process, however. We made some tests in the Czech Republic, and it turns out they have completely different Android models than we ha have here in Austria. And this is something we have to work on. We also had 23 different iPhone models. You wouldn't think that, but of course they um, build different models for every purpose. There were only minor differences. The interesting thing was that the iPhone, not the iPhone Pro, this works well, but the iPhone Pro needed some special treatment. So this was not working perfectly. And I think this will improve once we have the next generation. So let's get to some real life examples. We tested in three ski resorts comprehensively. In Kobryuna, in the Czech Republic, we processed 85,000 reader transactions on one lift because they only have one lift with um, six 
turnstiles. So it is a representative project. Our client used marketing to bring up the transactions to 18 percent. There was a discount of 15 percent on the tickets that were was bought on the counter. So this is an incentive for the tourists. The guests need the right impulses to adapt, to convert. If I can do it for myself with my own smartphone, it's fine. But then if I bring the whole family, um, it might be easier to buy just one ticket at the counter um, for the whole family and not scan four tickets, for example. We sold 90% of the BLE tickets online. This makes sense because why should I go to the counter and then scan a ticket if I can just buy it online right away and have it on the phone? It might be easier. As a ski resort, is it sensible to make a swift transaction, trans transformation or a slow process? Of course, you can skip chip cards completely, but this might be inconvenient for some people. Here you can see some videos of how the system works. She has a BLE ticket. You could see that it was quite convenient. This man needed to go down a bit, but it was still convenient. So we'll skip this part. Finally, also referencing my previous speaker, there is nothing disruptive about this technology. I don't think this changes anything for tourism. It is just a transformation from one medium to another. Replacing the chip card by the smartphone is not what it is only about. It's not as simple. It is not only about saving costs for paying paid for chip cards. You need to think how can I use this to get some data from the guests. The smartphone using a good transfer, uh, destination app leads to digitalization of everything. You can get to know the guests, everything goes into this digital program and you get information about the people. So then it is about what you want to do with these data. Many of our clients have a whole lot of data but have not processed these data yet. Yesterday we presented Access Intelligence for the first time. So the whole company and value chain is transforming towards digitalization, making sure that we are promoting digital transformation. The digital basis is, of course, essential, and we need to, to support ski resorts and help them with the technology so they can become digital. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be around here somewhere. Okay, thank you. Wer mal mal gehabt, was so now we've just heard what uh, will make our lives easier in the future. This was an interesting intermediate step coming from what we've heard from Mr. Santanda and this one now and what we're going to hear now. Um, Mr. Besold is CEO of Bright Places. It will speak about tourism as part of the entertainment industry 
and the challenges related to it. And I'm sure that we will be confronted with challenges. And you will now tell us what the challenges will look like. The floor is yours. I learned we have to wait and not and make sure that so, nothing is skipped. Also, so some patience here. here. Today, uh, I will talk about tourism in the entertainment industry. I want to explain it. We still believe that tourism is like an encapsulated area. That has brought us a lot of wealth. Tourism used to be a status symbol, but we are currently in the phenomenon of mass tourism. It doesn't matter if it's summer or winter. As Eduardo correctly said, mobility was the driver for this. We are able to fly around the world, drive across Europe in our car, take a train anywhere we want. Every discussion about flying makes this mobility approach complex and complicated. Europe is big, and within Europe we need a couple of hours on the plane to get from A to B. It is not possible or hardly possible to cover all this by train. Take a train from Zurich to Bucharest. Enjoy. Have fun. You will need a whole day for this. Tourism is a healthy sector, and we have a lot of resilient companies. What does this mean? Those are companies that are able to withstand crises. Here you can see a graph that you may know. Resilient companies are able to regenerate, are robust, can adapt to change. And this way they managed crises, not only our current energy crisis or COVID, there have been crises, crises, many crises in the past. In the 70s, I think not ma many of you will remember, there was scarcity of energy, but tourism managed to deal with all of this and get out strong. This is changing currently because disruptive organizations are entering the market. Disruptive companies will outperform resilient companies. Why is that? I would like to explain this to you. you here you have a timeline and an axis about um, performance promises Nobody travels with the cars that we had in the 50s. We have com more comfortable cars, we have more comfortable trains. This works if everybody also, the, the people on the market develop and there is an evolution. And the development has to exceed the guests' expectations. But then there comes a disruptive competitor. The guest demands change because there are no new opportunities. The guests like this because it's more beautiful, it's faster, it's better. And this is currently happening in the tourism sector. You might ask, who are those disruptive companies? Those are companies that have developed a completely new technology or that bring comprehensive know-how from, an, uh, from another field. Example of, some, of a very successful disruptive company, Disney. You all know the cartoons, the Disney characters. Disney makes 37% of the turnover through parks. It is not only about the entry fee, its turnovers in the park generated there, maybe drinks, snacks. 
auch einmal ein T-Shirt Or maybe kaufen. I buy some merchandising Aber because my child wants to have something. Gesagt, But Disney Hotels, wasn't satisfied with that. They built hotels. Because people should stay not only one day, but maybe several nights. And this accounts for almost 24% of their entire turnover at the moment. So you might say, well, okay, it is Disney, and Disney is successful. But then we look at other companies like Lego, for example. Lego needs to invest in this field. I think all of you know Lego, right? Okay. No, everybody's awake. I just Lego wanted to make sure. So Lego needs to invest because traditional um, shops are dying out. Small shops um, are being replaced by online trade. So Lego says, we need to make sure the children learn how to play with our products. Lego took a close look at the market, thinking we cannot compete with huge com companies such as or corporations such as Disney. So the topic of education is our topic of the future. In Europe, we do not know how we can develop the MINT competition of uh, competences of our children. MINT stands for um, natural sciences. Well, you all know, you know the abbreviation, I guess. So Lego wants the families to come to their parks to experience their products and materials because there is no shops anymore. And this it means that all of this needs to happen in the parks. So the money I before spent on the skiing holiday with my children, for example, I used to go to these parks, entertainment parks with my children. One example is Harry Potter World in London as well. If you have children, no chance you can avoid this. You know that. They have average ticket prices of 140 euros per person. And I'm mentioning this because we were speaking about high prices of ski tickets. 140 euros only for the entry fee. You haven't bought any drinks, any Harry Potter t-shirt. 140 euros for the ticket only. And this goes up to 250 euros for an exclusive tour. So they also try to get the money out of the guest's pockets. But if you thought that this is the end of it, I would like to say welcome to the new world. I don't know if anybody knows Yas Island. It will be the hugest, largest entertainment park in the world, in the uh, Arabic region, excuse me. It is an indoor entertainment park because, of course, as we know, it is so hot that you cannot have one outdoors. It is a mix of tourism, entertainment, and sports. You know the circuit from Formula One races. They also integrated Ferrari World there, so entertainment is very big there. They also have a Warner Brothers um, part there where you can race Batman, for example. It also includes the largest sea world in the Eastern Hemisphere. They pretend they're, it's all about um, saving the oceans there, so they have the sea world. They have a website, they have a great app to have a convenient experience for the guests. But if you thought that this is the best there is, enjoy reading the visions of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia because he has plans for a mega park in the Saudi desert. 
Why am, t am I telling you all this? We have tourism experts from the Alpine region here. So I want to tell you that it is, ex is extremely important to consider the ecological aspects, the possibilities and opportunities for society, and also political and legal options. We need to have politics and legal frameworks that are tourism friendly. If we want to survive in the tourism sector, we cannot only say we must only use a certain amount of electricity. It's also about what kind of water are we using, what is the value chain. We have the production sites of Leitner and Doppelmayr, for example, in Europe. And we're trying, or they are trying to save energy. Then there's a sociological aspect. We need good people working there. So companies need to have a close look at the local parameters and conditions. The sheikhs know that they have a desert in front of their house, and it is too hot to have anything outdoors. So they just built an indoor park. But we have lakes, we have mountains, we have nature that we can use. So we need to be sure what our, our target audience is. We need to have a shift of perspective. If you take a plane from New York to Seattle, it is like you're in the middle of Europe. Americans, if they take a plane to Seattle, it takes them just the same time as if they would go to Europe. So. This is not something that prevents them from coming here. You need to find relevant competitors. And it's not about copying this competitor. This results in a company vision and mission. As a company, you can only be successful if it has a purpose for society. And only if you combine a clear strategy and use for society, a company can be successful on the market. And this is where you build your authentic and unique experience. We did not like the notion of authenticity in the Alpine region. But this is not the most important thing. For some others, Yas is not authentic. But we have authentic landscapes. And people are looking for this. So now you started this transformation process. You are very happy about it, that you have this timeline, and then you build your cableway, and then suddenly there comes along AI. No pissed groomer is driving without AI. No cableway works without it. We need not only digital competence, but also analogous competence. Certain activities also need to be analogous and not digital. If you say entertainment or education is important, it also needs to be a mixture of analogous and digital. Then it becomes very interesting, because as a cable car operator, there have been two players 
when it comes to access, for example, you had player A and player B. When it comes to construction, you had company A and company B. But when it comes to selling all this to the customer, there are plenty of companies that all say, I know how e-commerce works. I also recommend you to come back this afternoon because we have one of the main providers, Jonas Moili from PriceNow, will speak about one opportunity, how it could work. But there are many options. But this is just the first step in the digitalization process. Because you do not only want to sell to one customer, you want the customer to return. And maybe also um, use the customer as an ambassador for your project. And then you need CRM systems. So welcome to the complex world of this. But do not worry, we will be at your side at Pride Places and accompany you in all of this. I would like to give the floor to Marcus. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't give the floor to Marcus, but I do not want to go ahead here. Bruno, please, please take the floor and introduce Marcus yourself. Let's stay disruptive, but let's also stay authentical. So let me introduce to you Markus Redl. He will speak about authenticity and what needs to be done to stay successful as a ski resort. Markus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, I've got twins at home, three years old. Who of you has children who cannot read and write yet? Oh, quite a few. You probably know um, what the image like this looks like for children. We're going to have a look at um, child's images uh, about tourism starting in 2020, going to 2030, and then 2040. So I'm going to show you three images. It's astonishing what a technical snowmaking can do. Astonishing what snow, man, snow making management can do and accomplish today. I'm responsible for a ski resort um, that's uh, below a thousand meters, and I'm happy to say that. And then we saw 15 degrees outside at Christmas this year, and we were skiing. We had all our ski courses held, no exception. But of course, there are limits, technical limits, and also economical and financial limitations. In the last 20 or 30 years, we learned a lot in Austria when it came to roadways, also when it came to what I call staging. And I don't mean this in a negative way. It's uh, about um, presenting an experience. And for me as a visitor to feel that this is what I am looking for, what me, my family, my friends are looking for. But of course, this needs to be processed and presented. So it needs to be a fully accessible, barrier-free uh, experience, because not everybody can uh, access a mountain. And we have made sure that um, the mountain as an experience is more or less barrier-free and fully accessible in Austria in summer as well as in winter. But the pendulum is swinging back. Alpine tourism used to be um, mainly in the summer. So St. Anton or Semmering um, are towns that have a direct railway connection. So this is where the summer was. And then over time in the 1970s, 1980s and 90s, this has shifted um, to over to winter. And now the pendulum is swinging back. 
So it's obviously about a full year use of infrastructure and substructure, so including accommodation, of course. I think there are only very few accommodation providers who say, OK, I'll only do one season, say, from December to April, and then I'll close down for the rest of the season. I think it's fewer than five. So these are the three images of the future that I would like to present to you and that are, can see the and show the future manifesting itself. Let me now look ahead. I am from Lower Austria and I'm speaking here for good reason because we are exposed to certain risks. And the climate-driven transformation process and the, the transformation based on different factors as well means that we uh, experience all these changes about um, 15 to 20 years earlier. So what do we need? Uh, what uh, does every destination and small uh, town have to be prepared for? It's to take a strategic decision. Where is the snow offer that needs to be maintained? Um, some say we need 100 days of operations if uh, uh, we need to be open on Christmas and so on and so forth. So the question is, where is the peace area? How much space do we still need to cover with snow? It doesn't always have to be the ones in higher altitudes because automated snowmaking has generated a lot of data. And we've seen that it's um, very dependent on the micro position and location. So it's not as easy as to say that, OK, it's higher up, therefore it, it's uh, an advantage ski resort. So it's not exactly about drawing the line at a 1,000 or 1,300 meters. You always have to look at individual cases and see, is it possible in terms of infrastructure, in terms of access points, um, of mobility, of uh, a substructure, the surrounding sub-infrastructure? And the experience for the visitor, knowing that if I book my snow holiday, um, then it will take place. This needs to be at the forefront. It is a highly strategic, the most important decision that you can make. So where will I focus my attention on? And then there are the nice to haves where it's not just about the essential services and offerings. So where you need to be um, flexible or even more flexible than in the past in terms of use. So the T-bar lift, for example, that brings out uh, mountain bikers, um, uh, brings up mountain bikers to the mountain. And this is actually a real life example. So two chairlifts were demolished and now they have a T-bar lift for the mountain bikers. And that is obviously also used as a ski lift in winter. So multiple use, using existing infrastructure, maybe in different ways. This is going to be a determining trend for the next 10 to 15 years. It partly worked with climbing. People come from coming from urban areas who started to boulder or lead climb at the Becker Street in Vienna. And all of a sudden, the inspiration arose and they said, OK, let's go outdoors. Let's do a Via Ferrata. And this cultural transfer, transfer is about youth culture. It's about what young people connect. It's not by chance that in uh, Wiener Neustadt, uh, we are uh, uh, erecting a skateboard and scooter park, a BMX park. So this is already quite similar to mountain biking or trail riding. So we need these transfers, climbing or what I call wheel sports or skateboarding, skateboarding, scooting. And the same applies to skiing and snowboarding. Dry slopes, that's nothing. Uh, maybe they can do it over in the UK, but it's nothing for us. 
I think we can and should say goodbye to that approach. We need it. We need it in the city, uh, next to the metro station. So maybe to be able to go snowboarding next to the metro station. If it's a dry slope, then it's a dry slope. So we need an urban um, sports and activity experience to um, connect to the young people. And then uh, and in, uh, next step, we can allow for a transfer into the mountains. So let's look even further ahead, 15 or 20 years. So these uh, six um, images of the future that we've just seen, it's not exactly accurate because uh, there will be regional and local differences and things will um, take place in parallel. And there are, of course, also another six pictures that you can add to this. But I just wanted to uh, bring it down to one common denominator because the all these processes go hand in hand with each other. It's rather cool here. We have a relatively high amount of water, even, uh, even though it's not entirely true anymore, looking at my water sources. But still, it's rather cool temperature-wise, and there is relatively uh, enough more water. So, but if you go to an area that's one and a half uh, hours away from uh, Vienna, then you get a feeling as if you were summiting the Mount Everest. So you go to one person after the other, um, where people want to go hiking. It's very busy, very popular, this area. Um, it's fleeing the heat. It's not just a theoretical concept. So we, we go there because we want to escape uh, the heat of the city. And there is a lake, and we used to go there because uh, the water was cool, but not anymore. Uh, there are now new hotels being built, um, and uh, this, of course, makes it more attractive. So we don't need to worry about future visitors. The challenge in this whole story is to channel, to to facilitate and orchestrate this process. It doesn't help if it becomes overly excessive. It uh, depend, uh, our quality of life depends on it, and that could also be dangerous. So we need to seize the opportunities that digital uh, visitor flow control um, offers. So to allow people in, um, a certain number of people in, and that we can actually really cater to. Or in practical terms, we can say that in ski areas, the access point is an issue. So how can people then come down from the mountain again? It can't be a first come, first service uh, approach in the ski resorts with these um, staged experience worlds like as I mentioned before, like mountain biking and so on and so forth. We need to use and make optimal use of the existing capacities. Bike and hike, I know it's become kind of a buzzword so that you take a bike and you cycle to the mountain and then go uh, mountaineering or hiking. But what I meant is hiking, biking in all its forms and variations. There is a wide variety of different options. And there will be a vi an even wider variety of different options in the next 10 to 20 years. The gravel bike is a very interesting example. Why is it so promising? because it uses existing infrastructure. I don't have to build anything new. They simply bike on uh, gravel roads, on dirt roads, using existing infrastructure. And then if we take wanting to be climate neutral by 2040 seriously, and that's our imperative, we will have to confront ourselves with the circular economy, with 
what can we do, how can we build infrastructure that is efficient. So this means that we would have to concern ourselves with energy generation, wind energy, photovoltaic, and there are many ski resorts that look, with a look to the future, have done a great job at this already. And then there are others who are now strategically and economically benefiting from that. So you don't need to have a glass ball to be able to look into the future, to know that um, uh, we will need different forms of energy, such as wind energy. And what we also hear is, so we heard earlier from Eduardo, 120 million Chinese arrivals uh, that we're going to see. And that, so that this can be measured in a fair and standardized way to determine how sustainable we are. So we obviously need to include the, the access or the transport with which visitors come to our regions. And I am saying this um, because I have a very high amount uh, of day, day visitors. And of course, I also see the, uh, the traffic that comes with it on a daily basis. We are working uh, we at an interreg, interregional European project um, where skis resource and also mountain resource uh, want to phase this very transformation process that you see up here, that uh, exchange their knowledge and expertise and ex experiences. So, for example, San Corona and Wechsel is one of the towns involved in this. And I then started to describe on my LinkedIn um, outlet what we are doing, how we are doing. So if you're interested, then, or if you're interested in these topics at all, please uh, connect with me here or on LinkedIn. Thank you. Lieber Markus, vielen, vielen Dank für deine Einblicke. Thank you, Markus. Thank you very much for your insights into a ski area that actually was not meant to exist anymore. So what's possible, what you can do. Thank you very much. So please stay with us. I now decided to change our agenda. The panel discussion will not take place right now, but I am taking the liberty to reach out to Isabella Hinterleitner. And I would li she's also from Lower Austria, and I uh, would like to ask her a few questions. So it's not just men who uh, are here on stage. So just stay where you are, and um, I will give you a microphone. And I, I will ask her two questions, but please don't go away after that, because it's going to be interesting again. We're not going to have the panel discussion, as said, but later we'll have a um, comedy-like summary given by Markus Linder, who has been writing everything down um, for two hours now, and he will then later on present a summary of today's event or the morning to you in a musical and comedy form. Isabella, I have prepared a couple of questions for you. You did a lot of online work. Why were you forced to go online? Was it the logical consequence? What is it about? Thank you for the question. I will turn around so everybody can see me. Well, yeah, we were kind of forced, actually. The COVID crisis forced us to think intensively about how to deal with the anticipated very high volume of visitors. Online ticketing was our focus area. 
And then we decided to go online only, so you could only come to the ski resort if you already had a valid ticket. In Lower Austria, all the ski resorts that were open in the times of COVID got together and did the same. So these are resorts that are also accessible from Vienna, for example. We had a great exchange and had intensive experience with experiences with online ticketing systems. We also saw that many things that were deemed impossible in the industry, such as the guests would not buy tickets online. There was the idea that our guests and visitors would not do this and would not be able to. But turns out we do have those kinds of visitors. So we established a system and we are staying on this path. So COVID started three years ago, so you have three years of experience with this. What is your experience like? What kind of improvements did you experience? But maybe there have also been some things that have become worse. Well, we dealt with the demands of the cable car operators. We did not only look at the online ticketing as such, but we also made a tender for a marketing and sales platform, and we found a great partner that supports us. So we do not only have an e-commerce platform, but also have dynamic pricing, and we have a CRM platform. I like to speak of houses that we are building and bridges, paths that are connecting those houses. We are still at the beginning of a process. We want to create a marketplace for Low Austria as a region that deals with everything that has to do with holidays in the mountains. This winter, we also made some experiences that I am happy to share with you if you reach out to me. I think one of the most important issues of the future is to integrate all the employees more. We did a lot in a very short time, and this has been a very challenging process for all the employees. They needed to get familiar with some tools. Together with our partner Price Now, we will have to transform or translate the results from the winter season into ideas for the future. We have challenges because we are the day travel at destinations. So destinations where people also stay overnight um, are different. When it comes to data quality, we will have a lot on our plate still, but we have also learned a lot. And I think in the future, we will have more valid data, better data. We're taking baby steps in this process and we have high expectations for our future. So this is a kind of a gravel path that is difficult for you. Is that right? But was it worth it for you? We also we saw even during COVID that there are so many approaches 
there are so many opportunities to intervene. In early winter, I told our employees several times that the only way to interact with the visitors is going to the parking area and then just talk to them. This was the only way to contact the visitors. And I think we need to get the opportunity to contact all of our visitors on a regular basis without this system. So these tools are a perfect way for doing this. And I think there are many things that we can still do, many levers to pull. So I will present to you Markus Linda, who was closely listening to every speaker, and he will now do a kind of comedy. The floor is yours. This will not be interpreted. From the keynote speaker to the keynote player, Dr. Eduardo Santander, the keyboard speaker, has sich and his organization vorgestellt. ETC. It's very nice when they all yeah, 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 yeah. ETC is there for you and me. European Travel Commission works with highest permission. It was part of the Marshall Plan. Those founders say. is our thing for ETC. Er hat gesprochen, es gibt eine große Polarisierung und wenig Dialog. Talk to me, baby. Don't polarize. I said talk to me, baby. Don't polarize. Let's find a dialogue that would be wise. Dr. Santander said, es gibt a money time matrix. Money is running out. Time, that's what it's all about. You have to check When money runs out Is the tourist with a weg Aber er ging noch weiter Dr. Santander sagte Wichtig wäre das Ziel Better place to live Better place to visit Also die Menschen, die in den Regionen wohnen Und die Besucher Better place to live, better place to visit. Let's follow the path as much as we can. So bada boo, so bada boo, so bada boo. Better place to live, better place to visit. Let's follow the way as much as we can. Und dann noch eine wichtige Feststellung. From nothing comes nothing. Nothing from nothing comes nothing. We have to act plan B, plan C. Nothing from nothing comes nothing. We gotta have something, then tourism has ability. An applause for Dr. Eduardo Santander. Wir hatten einen Vortrag von der Firma Access von Markus Weyra. I found my thrill With Bluetooth on Ski Hill With 
Weirer. Gernot Pesold von Bright Places hat ein Szenario entwickelt, das uns erschaudern macht. Resilient ist der Schiff, den jeder kennt. Disruptive Typen kommen, bis er flennt. Outperformed, alles neu von hinten bis vorn. Disney ändert alles in Perl. Und früher war es resilient. Und er hat natürlich eine Lösung angeboten. Neben Bright Places. Congratulations for your transformation. There is a need for change and Gernot is with you. Our relation in transformation. So as we have to act, should we do? An applause for Gernot Pesold. Markus Redl berichtete aus Niederösterreich über eventuelle Zukünfte ohne Snow. Ich war nach St. Corona. Das soll sich für alle lohnen. Ich freue mich schon also. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Nice to have and must have. Wie geht's jetzt weiter, Chef? Ich freue mich schon also. Es geht da ohne, ohne Snow. Er hat eine ganz eigene Form der Präsentation erfunden. Wimmelbild, Wimmelbild, ja, das ist so schön. Alles kann man dort auf einem Blatt sehen. Ja, Wimmelbild, Wimmelbild, nicht nur Kinder lieben's. Ja, das ist eine gute Form, es ist so schön. Und zum Schluss hat er noch Werbung gemacht für seine Heimat. Ötschergräben. Das müssen Sie erleben. Ötsche Herr Gräben, das müssen Sie erleben. Ich stelle mir gerne als Tourismusbotschafter zur Verfügung. Digitale Besucher. Moment. Digitale Besucherstromlenkung. Das geht ganz ohne Kränkung. Digitale Besucherstromlenkung. Das geht ganz ohne Kränkung. Ein Applaus für Markus Redl. Das war meine Zusammenfassung. Ja, meine so, ladies and gentlemen, dear Markus, please don't leave. We will end this morning session together. So this has been true diversity. So it's not the host or the presenter who will do the, the, the summary. We, we, you can do it much, much better. So thank you very much, Markus. I would like to extend my gratitude also to the speakers and to the audience. We'll continue with session two at 12.30 uh, about marketing and digital data. How can we control visitor flows? What do we need? What is important? So once again, thank you very much for this morning session. Thank you for being here. Thank you to all the speakers. If you have to travel back now, the Eduardo, safe trip home. And for everybody else, enjoy your stay at the trade fair. Thank you very much, and I'll see you again at 12.30.
Ja, ich darf Sie. Welcome to the second session of the Interalpine Inspiration Days 2023. Thank you for finding your way to us in this kind of lunch break. You will not regret it. Our topic for this afternoon is about marketing. We have five speeches and they are all very unique. At the end, we will have a comedic summary of all the speeches, so make sure you, you stay after the speeches for this piece of entertainment. We saw before in the morning session it was really great, so make sure you don't miss it. So he will summarize everything that those speakers will present to you in the next 90 to 100 minutes. Let me introduce to you President and CEO of the a Swiss von Roll Infratech Group, Jörg Brandt. He will speak about water. He has 87% of water on the table. There is 13% 13 of alcohol in his glass. He knows what he's talking about, so that's it from me. Jörg, you will tell us what waterless has to do with data, how critical it is, and how important it is to make sure that there's a proper glass of wine on the table in the end. Thank you very much. What I actually wanted to say is that I start with water, but only 80%, 87% of water, but let's get, let's dive right into it. The way to zero water loss. Together, we can fight against the water crisis and create safety in the mountains. So what is, the, it is, a, is it about? First of all, zero water loss and mountains, how are they connected? I tell you that we are at the right place here. All of us are at the right event here in Innsbruck because our topic is not cable cars, slopes, groomers. This comes at a later stage. Our basic topic, what it all comes back to, is water, H2O. And then in small print, of course, the mountains in brackets. I'm from Switzerland, so fir first thing you think about is the Matterhorn Mountain. Here you can see it in the picture with a beautiful mountain lake. A beautiful mountain lake, you see snow. And still, water is becoming a scarce resource. You know, if this picture is what represents winter tourism in 2030, there will not be tourism in 2030, because this is not what people enjoy. But it's not only about water on the slopes. Strategic water is also becoming scarce. What is strategic water? This is strategic water. Usually it accumulates in glaciers, in snow, that we do not have enough of. Glaciers are melting. And then we get it from the tap. Why is it strategic? In the last two to three years, we experienced the COVID crisis. This was practice run for us because possibly the next virus could become even more dangerous, maybe like Ebola or similar. If this becomes reality, we do not have to lock in people because they will be afraid. 
and nobody will you don't, will not want anybody to bring pizza to your home. You will not want to see anyone. But what do you need? You need water, you need energy. So drinking water from the tap is strategic water, and this is becoming a scarce resource. In Switzerland, we do not have drinking water quality everywhere. In the central plateau, we have pollution with pesticides, for example. And we need, of course, to also produce food for all the people. So what do we do if we have this problem? We just lift the threshold values. What people are not aware of is that water loss equals a waste of energy. Let's do a small calculation together. Before water comes out of our taps, we need energy, we need pumps, we need water processing. So we have a loss of energy of 0.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water loss. So we are wasting a lot of energy with losing water. But there is also CO2 as a factor. 0.5 kilowatt hours of, kilo, uh, of water loss of loss of energy equals 500 grams of CO2. This example shows coal. And I have to say the energy grids are interconnected. And energy, in the end, created by carbon-fired um, plants results in CO2 emissions. We should not point our fingers at others. I'm pointing my finger into Switzerland. The question is, how much energy do we lose annually? How much water is lost in Switzerland on a yearly basis in cubic meters and in Swiss francs? We have a great grid in Switzerland, losing around 10% of water between the source and the consumer. It is 120 million cubic meters of water a year. This equals 2.5 five million luxury people. So everybody in Europe, we are all luxury people. We, we use tons of water. 2.5 million lux luxury people. This is what we lose every year in our water grid. This equals 60 million kilowatt hours of energy. This is the annual need of about 4,000 luxury households, that is, European households. So in Swiss francs, strategic water used for toilets, for gardening, for cleaning our cars, costs about two francs, Swiss francs, in Switzerland. This is a similar situation in other European countries. We are speaking of a loss of 240 million Swiss francs annually caused by water loss and about 18 million Swiss francs of loss of energy. And these are just hard facts. When we started speaking or thinking about water loss three to five years ago in Switzerland, we thought that water is just 
naturally a natural resource that never ends. But this has changed. We have communities today that have that don't have enough water, that have to buy water from elsewhere. There are countries selling oil or gas. Why shouldn't other places sell strategic water? It is a big business with just two francs um, per cubic meter. But it, with this amount of 240 million, this becomes an interesting sum. And let's not forget about the 60,000, 60 million kilos of CO2. The water crisis, ladies and gentlemen, is here. This is evident. But where is our opportunity when it comes to water? Every, as every coin has two sides, every crisis has an opportunity. So where is this opportunity when it comes to water? It is everywhere where we think and implement zero water loss. How can we achieve that? We can achieve that by defining and realizing thinking about our water consumption and having zero water loss as a mindset in our communities and with our water suppliers. So we need to create projects. Of course, this also is an expensive process. However, it would be even more expensive if we didn't implement zero water loss. Much more expensive. Here you can see an example. The climate is warming. We are experiencing landslides. This is a picture um, from the valley or the canton of Grisens in Switzerland. So this is not a picture from Turkey. It is from Switzerland. This is a consequence as well. I think a huge part of the migration crisis is a water crisis. We had a painter in the Swiss canton of Engadin. It is, well, now. Back then he painted great pictures, but now there are no people anymore there. It is empty. And before it was different. Because we have tourism that is based on water and on having enough water supply. This is the Po River in Italy last year. We can see similar pictures from the Rhine. And this is Grand Dixons, where we produce green energy in Switzerland. Green energy for green mobility. Po, Grand Dixons. This one needs water. This wants to produce green energy and green water for mobility. It is difficult to quote Churchill, but he is said to have said that there are five meals between civilization and a house. And civilization and chaos, there are five meals. So last year taught us to think the unthinkable. So we should act. I don't think we can use the water the way we do here in this reservoir if the Ital Italians need it so badly. 
zero waterless in numbers. We have developed the Echo Planner tool. You can use visit the site. You can calculate the cost of water loss in relation to zero water loss projects. That means leak detection, monitoring, visualization, maintenance, alarm systems. Cost of water loss, profit of zero water loss. Cost of water loss. Profit of zero water loss. It is not a precise science. But as a dear friend of mine said, better about right than precisely wrong. So it is about being just about right. It is more important than being accurate in every detail. EcuPlanner, the tool will show you why it's worth it. Zero waterless projects from a technical perspective, what are we looking at? In the center, and this is not only von Roll, others have this as well, but I'm, of course, speaking about our example. <coughs> Wonderful. So in the center, you have the visualization software infraport. And scattered around it, you see fundamental topics for a zero water loss strategy. And it's about safety tools, hardware, servicing systems, monitoring systems, and leak detection systems. All those are integrated in this platform. We achieve zero water loss by integrating products, services, and software. So it's not only about detecting leaks. So this is zero water loss. And you don't have to buy it from Fonroll. There's a whole market. However, you need to integrate this solution, and you have to act. Let's speak about leak detection. Highly sensitive leak detection systems exist, and they can show you very precisely where there is a leak. There are monitoring tools that can monitor movements of mountains. They can monitor permafrost in the mountains. They are also integrated in infraport. Services. Looking around the world, the Swiss and the Austrians are almost the only ones offering the services. And this kind of service and maintenance. So other, in other countries, they just build a system and then that's it. But we also maintain our system. Hardware. The right hardware with the right price for zero water loss is important because having pipelines shipped from China to Europe and having nobody working here and then our know-how goes to those other places. In the COVID crisis, we heard about bringing our supply chains back to Europe, but this was just blah, blah. It has stayed the same. We need to make sure that our know-how stays where we need it, also in the third world, the so-called third world, in many aspects. I think they are miles ahead of us. Let's speak about safety. This is about camera systems, protection of water access areas. In Switzerland, we have 
über dem Brunnen gibt es einen Deckel. Reservoirs, where we store der water. And we have wells. We have hatches that are secured with screws. You can open, open this screw and then put something into the water and nobody will notice, but someday later, sometime later, it will be noticed. Then you just have to wear a yellow vest with security on the back. People will applaud you even. So you can do this without being noticed. And we do not have safety when it comes to our water storage. So it is important that we start today when we when it's not very urgent yet. On Infraport, here you can see an example what it looks like. It's a mountainous landscape. There are other systems. I think it's the best, but of course there are others. Let's have a look at the society um, aspect of zero water loss. We create work for people in local communities in the mountains. We provide jobs also in administration. Zero water loss also creates qualified and qualifying workplaces that are all about water in our local communities where we also use the water. So this is zero water loss on a social level. Ladies and gentlemen, we started Zero Waterless five years ago. I wish I had invented it, but it was a dear friend of mine who told me that we are always speaking about wasting and consumption of water. Actually, we are speaking about zero water loss. It is a mindset. It is respecting our environment, respecting our future, commitment to the things we can do right today. Our competitors say, stop dreaming. Zero water loss is impossible. But I tell them, maybe you just have the wrong mindset. But if you have the right mindset, you're on the right path. A mindset makes a opportunity creates an opportunity from a water crisis so we can win together i see that everybody is still awake and nobody is sleeping thank you very much for your attention dear Jürg, um, you haven't finished your 87 percent just yet this has been an eye-opener for me and I'm sure many other people here in the room as well. This is something that takes place usually in a hidden uh, area, but um, it costs a lot of money and it is has increasingly becoming scarce water. And summing up, I would like to ask you one question. So you showed us the picture of the reservoir of the dried out Po area and you dare to think the uh, unimaginable. So I'm um, not to mention the, the lid of the well. So, but it's not, not a long way to until we will wage war about water, right? I agree with you. Just one year ago, nobody would have thought that there would be war again in Europe. For one year now, more than one year now, we've experienced war at our continent again. So there are uh, 35 uh, has just been ordered once the coordinates are being released by the US. So just a while ago, we, uh, uh, we would not have thought it's possible that we might order weapons to defend our water. 
But these are important reflections and considerations because we don't concern ourselves with these topics, then we will have a problem of water shortage. And this will not go about in a civilized way. I think that was a very clear answer to my question. This unthinkable might become reality. So the host at the very end of a presentation always tries to avoid the questions. Are there any other questions? Nevertheless, I would like to ask you, do you have any questions at all for our presenter that you would like to ask Jürgen Brandt about a topic that I think is more pressing and urgent than ever? I know it's lunchtime, but still. Ah, well, we're lucky we've won. Nobody's asking a question. Oh, no, I think that there is a question in the back. Please use a microphone. In times of modern technology, it's obvious that we need to use a mic. We learned a lot today. Uh, among other things, that there's a 10% water leakage in Switzerland. These are average numbers. I am aware of a region that loses about 60% um, of water. Are there any peak values and are there any lower numbers? If 10% is the average, what are the highest and lowest numbers? So a good community that has this mindset uh, has a figure of about 5%. It seems that 5% is a figure that can hardly become any lower currently. And those who um, don't do such a good job in Switzerland lose about 20%. And the numbers in Europe are higher. So it's about permanent maintenance and regulatory provisions that we are slowly beginning to take seriously because there are annual inspections. And leak detection um, has, uh, cr has been derived based on all of this, of course. And just to, to tell you a short story, I was in Saudi Arabia and there is zero water loss. Just because they simply lie to each other, because everybody who raises the topic will, is sent to the desert straight away. So let's have a reasonable debate. Let's be realistic. We have a lot of water loss and we need zero water loss. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the audience? No, so Jörg, thank you very much. Please enjoy the remaining 80, 70, 87%. I've learned a lot today, and I kindly ask you to see our sound engineer because we'll need your microphone. And now I would like to ask our next two speakers to join me on stage. Monika Oblonczyk from AWS and Andreas Czauna from Auvaria. Warm welcome to the two of you. Now we will speak about data, big data, because data is not just a trend. Data poses a challenge. And what the challenges are all about is what you are going to tell us now. Thank you. So we wanted to do the presentation in English. My name is Monika Oblonczyk, and um, my name is Andreas Czauna, and I work for Auvaria. Uh, so, and because we want to be as inclusive as possible, we'll switch to English now, but you are welcome to ask your question at the end in any language. So why did we choose this title? Actually, we all know trends come and go, right? Do you remember? When Oops. Okay, I just leave it there. <laughs> Do you remember the trend when people started talking to their devices, asking a question to a device? What's the weather today? Was it going to be tomorrow? Actually, back then, I thought this was a trend. I will never talk to a device, so I can look it up myself, right? Why do I need to do this? Now fast forward, I don't know how many years, I have three devices at home that have names. I call them somehow, they have a name, you all know them. I talk to my phone, ask questions, or I browse in the internet and look for something because I don't want to look it up myself, and I get the answer from a machine. And I think this is now normality, so this is not a trend anymore. AI, something like this. 
And same as it with data. I would not say data is a trend anymore. Data has arrived. For example, who of you has a smartwatch? Maybe not now, maybe who has a smartwatch in general? Okay, I can see many people and I think, or smart home, I don't know, something like this. But smartwatch, for example, I bet most of you don't only use your smartwatch for checking the clock or pretending to check the clock and read messages, but also to check how many steps you've taken today, for example. And based on the data of how many steps you've taken today, okay, I've taken 10,000 steps, I don't need to go to the gym anymore. Or I've taken enough steps, I've burned enough calories so I can enjoy an ice cream. Or maybe not, if you have not taken enough. And for us individuals, it seems to be very easy to leverage data to make decisions based on this. On the other side, we have companies that can leverage data for making better business decisions. But it's not as easy as buying a smartwatch and making decisions. And this is why we are going to talk today about what are the challenges of incorporating data into our business. Getting started, what are the most challenges? But we, before we come to the challenges, we also want to talk about the chances that we have. So we have prepared two stories of entrepreneurs that use data for their advantage. We are all here in beautiful Innsbruck, where we love skiing, we love snow. And for example, we have the CEO of any hotel. And any hotel, the CEO, let's call him Heinz, has a beautiful hotel. And as every year, he knows family Huber is coming. There are many families coming back, actually, every year. Family Huber consists of mom, dad, little Christina, and also Klaus. Actually, Klaus is not a baby anymore, but Klaus has grown up. He's a little boy now. And what any hotel is concerned about now is making the best experience for family Huber. But how can any hotel ensure that they have the best experience they can imagine? The answer to this is data. So what does it mean making best experience out of data? So we have some examples for how any hotel can leverage data for family Huber. One example could be building customer trust, for example, based on data on special occasions. For example, Family Huber comes and any hotel celebrates Christina's birthday. Happy birthday, Christina. This builds trust, don't you think? I would be happy if someone celebrates my birthday, even though I don't know them. Other example could be customized offerings. How about uh, if we give you percentage on skiing, Family Huber, we love you, we know you love skiing. We give you on the first day percentage on this. Based on the data of the past, you know what family Huba likes to do, right? Another experience could be experience-based marketing. Oh, so my, you, I hope you can read it still. <laughs> experience-based marketing, for example, you know that Klaus has grown up and it's now a different family than last year because it's not a baby anymore but a small child. So you can be make based, uh, decisions based on what family typically, like family Hubas, are do. For example, take the parents to spa and bring the kids to the playground. Another thing can be, for example, saving time for family Huba for doing other things. So you have the data from family Huba where they live, what's other information, paying information, for example. So you don't need to collect it again, right? So save up time for them. And yeah, at the end, 
Only thing that matters is that Family Huba comes back next year as well, because they had the best experience ever. And we have another example of the CEO of any company. And the CEO of any company who's a ski lift operator is concerned about other things like ski slopes, ski lifts, and ticketing, for example. And also, the CEO of any company asks herself, how can I make the best out of the season? And we all know, the season is short, right? So how can we make the best out of the season? And the answer to this, again, is data. Any hotel, uh, any company now can, has, can have different experiences on how to make the best of the season. One example could be predictive maintenance. Take the data that your she lifts, for example, produce on heat, vibration, to detect whether they can occur problems in advance. So you never have to stop, for example, she lifts for, um, for reparation or something like this. Also, lift scheduling based on the data you have on how many people are arriving at your ski slopes, you can run the lifts a little bit slower or faster if it's more people coming. That saves you money if you don't use that much energy. Talking about energy, you can collect information, data on energy consumption. When is energy, usually the prices are high, you know when, and you can based on the data you have on when you, how, how much the energy costs back then or in the future, you can make predictions and make strategic decisions on where and how you buy your energy. And last but not least, minimize operational tasks. So also based on the data, for example, on the weather, you know tomorrow it's raining. We know not many people are coming. So why do you send your people then to work if you know there's nothing to work? So based on the data, on the weather, for example, you can make decisions and maximize your production of the season and make the best out of the season. Exactly, yeah. So these are only some use cases, of course. There are a ton out there, and I am sure that some or most of you are already working in this area. So we walked around and had a lot of great talks already with some of you, and we see that the progress is there. So it's quite clear that we need data to make the most of the, out of the season, for example, but also to drive business value in general in the end, right? So the important thing what we want to highlight here in this session is that business or data-driven businesses have an advantage. And the advantage is, in fact, that most of the time, 23 times more likely to acquire new customers, data-driven companies. Then also, they are six times more likely to retain customers. Also highly important, of course. And last but not least, they are also 50 times more likely to deliver value to their customers. So to increase customer satisfaction, and we all know this is the key in the end, to retain customers, but also to drive our business value. But the question is, and this is what we want to talk about today, is how can we actually start with a data journey, more or less? So some of you, as I said, are already in there. Some of you maybe are thinking about it. And some are maybe one step before already. So there are challenges, of course. And if we talk about IT projects, could be cumbersome, as we know, especially big transformation projects. Uh, yeah, a big risk for a lot of companies. And we see it also in other areas. So not only in data topics, but also, for example, cloud migrations as well. The biggest challenge for companies is culture or organizational change. And we saw that 92% of companies actually say this, that culture is the biggest roadblocker to get started with a data-driven business model. 
So what we have to do is we have to focus on the culture and the organization itself and don't skip it. Because honestly, from a technical perspective, we can pretty much solve everything nowadays. Pretty much. Not everything, but pretty much. Cultural topics are way harder to solve and to prepare for change. So we have to focus on that. So that we not only have a site on the tech value that we will generate, but also the business value. And business value will come through people in the end. So let's have a look how we can start there to get the most out of our organization, transform it, and prepare it to be a data-driven organization. So there's a framework, it's called the four E's of data culture. So we will shortly walk over it. So first, engage in data-driven decision-making. So as, as I said, in every big transformation project or initiative, you have to identify a single-threaded leader in your organization. In best case, a respected one, of course. Because he will drive these initiatives forward and guides your teams to be able to actually speak up about potential use cases they have identified. And this is the most important step. So in the end, you need management buy-in. Without this, it will be hard to transform into a data-driven organization. Second, educate everyone. What does it mean? So, not everyone has to be a data scientist. Luckily, I would say. <laughs> but you should make sure that across roles in your organization, a common understanding about data and analytics is there. So to identify these use cases, understand it a little bit more, because this will accelerate the process of adopting these data-driven organization or business models in the end. So make sure that everyone in the organization actually understands the basics of data and analytics. Then third, eliminate data blockers. So one of the biggest blockers in general is silos within the organization. In this case, data silos. So maybe you already have a data team. Make sure that the knowledge that is there is not held hostage and can't be spread across the organization. So this is, of course, related again to engaging data-driven decision-making. So data should be a value that is used by everyone in the organization. Fourth, enable frontline action. What does it mean? So the people working at the front line, so for example, which are most closely to the customer, these are the people that will know what data could drive in terms of business value, customer satisfaction, but also personal satisfaction, right? So they know when they can use data to make their life easier as well but also for the customer as well. So enable them to speak up and to not rely sorely on the opinion of the highest paid person, so to say. So we have a term for that, the hippo. So the mm -hmm. highest person paid opinion. Um, this can block everything and slow it down. So include everyone, transparency is everything more or less. So in the end, this means what we need is to create a culture that positions the data at the center of their daily doing and their strategy. And this can be a pretty long process, to be honest. But don't forget about it. So if you start to think about integrating data in your business model to accelerate it, don't forget about the culture itself and the organization. So not only technical, but also have a view on this. Are there more challenges when you're adopting a data culture or, in general, a data-driven business model? So it would be nice if there is now a big flashing no, like the data we saw before. But of course, there are more challenges. And these are more like from a technical perspective. <clears throat> so capacity. First question, where do I store my data? Legit question, of course. Cloud can help here, for example. Scalability. How can I prepare for ever-growing data? So data is growing and growing. But then also, highly important to get started with, don't do it afterwards. 
security. Secure your data. Make sure it is encrypted. To sleep tight at night in the end. Yeah? And lastly, and probably most importantly, cost. How can I actually afford storing this much data? And there's one solution for that. It's called the modern data architecture, or also known as the data lake house. So what, it is, what is it? It's, in the end, a data lake combined with a data warehouse. So the data lake has the efficiency and cost efficiency especially, combined then with the agility and speed of data warehouses to hold costs low, but to be fast to actually enable, for example, real-time analytics and more for your predictive maintenance use cases and others. If you want to get started with this idea, it could be challenging, as we saw. But we are also here to support you, of course. So what we typically do is to get a little bit deeper into this topic to start with a workshop. So we get our hands dirty, try it out, and learn more about data and identify your actual use cases behind it, if there are any. And if there are any, we will proceed to build a business case. In fact, it's a directional business case. So we don't hold up the process for months to build a rough business case that has 200 plus pages, but rather to have a reasonable confidence in achieving the business values that we expect as an outcome, and to provide this confidence into the organization to proceed with the process. And after that, we try it out. We build a proof of concept, test it, evaluate it, and if it still holds true that you have this business value, then we can derive an action plan or a roadmap that lies out the next steps over the next month, years probably, especially in a cultural sense, to get started there. So if you have any questions to dig deeper into the data topic, feel free to just hit us up. We are in the back there as well, but also afterwards. Feel free to ask as many questions as you have. So this should be a short introduction to how to get started with data. And now, after us, um, there will be an interesting talk also um, about an actual use case that has already been implemented. So from Techno Alpine, uh, they are pretty integrated already in, into these topics. And yeah, will be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you, everyone. And thank you very yeah, much. if you have questions, hit us up afterwards. Thank you. Andreas, yes, Monica, thanks very much for that informative data session, so to say. Starting with, has anybody birthday today? Because normally we should know that and we don't know. You should know it, actually. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. This is, what, this is actually, sorry, I'm in, in the picture. Uh, this is why, why I'm asking. Has somebody or has someone birthday today? No. Otherwise, I would have spent a bottle of champagne. So, I, I, so you see, data can even help me saving money. Uh, but this is not uh, the, the intention of, of, of uh, data in, in, in general. Uh, my question uh, to, to you both is basically, you said clearly, and I fully uh, agree with you, that 92% see culture as the biggest showstopper, so to say. Mm -hmm. We can overcome that in larger, co in larger corporations, I think, rather easy, but what are the small to medium enterprises? And, and as we know, in particularly in the industry where we're in here, mm -hmm. uh, clearly such companies, what can they do to make advantage of data? Yeah. What would you recommend, yeah. if you allow me to ask? So the interesting thing is that especially enterprises ha have a really hard time getting started with these topics because they're most of the time as business units separated from each other, so they have way more troubles, actually. So you have an advantage already. Um, the thing is, you can start fairly quickly. Okay. So if you bring everyone in, into the team, drive transparency, and then dive a little bit deeper into workshops, for example, to drive the message across, then you're already on a, on a good track. And then you have to think about technology and just identify persons in your organization that are willing to drive this topic, and then the rest will come, actually. 
over time. So, in my opinion, you have an advantage over big corporations, definitely. Yeah, normally they are much more flexible. Yes. yes Particularly yes. When, when the key persons in such companies uh, take the idea and, and, and carry them through, through, the, through the whole process. Exactly. Yeah. And the good thing is actually you never need to produce this data. Actually the data is there already. You just need to put it somewhere and do something with it. And this, starting with this is pretty fair, easy for especially small companies. As we as Messe Innsbruck have now switched on the data monitor, we are start recording everything, start what you're thinking. Are there any questions? <laughs> no, not at all. I thought you're already awake a little bit more, but we <laughs> bring you there sooner or later, don't worry. Nevertheless, meeting brings me to an end for session number two. Monica, Andreas, thanks very much. Thank it was a great pleasure to have you on board. Stay with us Thank and you very much. listen to what Markus is thinking about, about you. Bring me to next. It's must I eigentlich Italienisch können da. Oh, buongiorno. I would love to speak Marcus Italian, Pfeiffer but I don't. Markus Pfeiffer from Techno Alpine is our next speaker. He also uses big data. However, Techno Alpine analyzes data in snowmaking in order to become more efficient. Markus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. South Tyrol and Italy, this is a whole different story, but I don't want to get into that now. In South Tyrol, sometimes people like to be more Italian and sometimes more Austrian. It depends on the situation. The South Tyrol people combine both spirits, a German sense of detail and an Italian sense of relaxedness. I would like to say that this presentation contains product placement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my presentation and let's dive into the world of data. We heard about data collection before and how important it is to collect data. At Techno Alpine, we believe, and I think you believe that too, that data are the key to becoming more efficient. Many are afraid of data being collected. However, collecting data is important because no data, no party. That's as simple as it gets. Once the data is available, big data, data warehouse, data lake, we have a delta house as well, meanwhile, so, and there's a delta warehouse, so this is a process that is developing, and those data just wait for being analyzed by experts. We have tons of data, but we need to extract the right data from those, from this pool of data, and I think this is the goal of our millennium data, using the data properly is an art with the right data and by interpreting the correct data, we can achieve a lot. Think of your home, think of your refrigerator. This can also be optimized in a sustainable way. It is not only about snowmaking. Here you can see a lot of numbers, calculating snowing time. Um, everybody who works in snowmaking knows that we have to calculate. And then for this, we need to make a fact check. We need to create a master plan based on certain numbers. We need to see what duration do we want the snow making machines to work. We need to define a master plan and define limits. This is very important. 
so that I don't produce too much snow. Well, this is a whole other topic, whole other topic, making too much snow. But if we make too much snow, this is just not feasible. You used water that you could use for something else. And this is a lot of wasted energy in the end. Another thing you have to analyze is the flow in the different pipes. We're speaking about about pressure loss, about water temperature on the slopes. Because the colder the water, the more efficient. Then we have to look at snow quality, and there can be discussions about what number is drier or wetter snow. But this helps us to see whether there an improvement can be achieved by shifting the snow temperature. So let's speak about weather. What do they say? You cannot um, argue about women or the weather. Weather forecasts have to be considered in the process. We saw it in the previous speech already. The temperatures are very important to efficiently use my snowmaking windows. Maybe I can wait for a couple of hours if I know that it will become cooler and maybe tons of snowmakers from the village will give me a call and ask why why don't you use your snowmake making machine but I have my weather forecast and I know on my mountain the temperatures will cool down in two hours so I can be more efficient if I start the snow gun two hours later it is all about exact planning, good preparation, and this gives me better control of my timeline. It is becoming warmer. This is a fact. The wet bulb temperatures you can see here are 71.5% of times are wet bulb temperatures. In this time, we produce most of our snow. We produce 63.2% of the annual volume. That means that we need to adapt our guns to this temperature in order to use our snow-making windows in an optimal way. So let's dive into the world of engine rooms. 65% of energy go into water supply on average. That means pumps, cooling water, and also ventilation of reservoirs. 65%. This means that there is a lot of energy saving potential in the engine room. There is an, an easy calculation. By saving five bar, you can save approximately 16% of energy. I always have to imagine my own snowmaking system. How can I implement this? It's easy. We have installed frequency drives in most systems, so you can just um, decelerate because you do not need the high frequency or you try to make snow in the upper shafts in order to bring down the snow making times you all know the colder it is 
the more snow you can produce. Their adjustments can be made in the control systems, and I need to look at my own system and to develop my own strategy for my system. So there is this saving energy saving potential. We can also make the pumps more efficient. There is a minimum flow, of course, and the pump should be on minimum flow rate as little time as possible, because the important thing is that it has the water has to be pumped where it is needed, where it can be used to make snow. Mittlerweile sind die Pumpstationen oder die Maschinenräume im Megawattbereich. Our pump stations can work in the megawatt range. They have many snow guns that are supplied that can be turned on and off. There is potential for using multiple pumps at the same time. The important thing is not to have as many as possible running. The important thing is to use each pump up to their maximum level and then start turning on the next one. Not, every, not all of them at the same time. We also do data analysis and help our customers processing their data. We would like to speak about um, this with potential customers as well. If you're interested in having an analysis of your data for your mountain, for your systems, and maybe together we can create improvement for you. Savings can also be made with central air systems and pressure levels. Mostly, most systems use 8 bar, but you could also use 7 bar or 6 bar. And there are various ways of adjusting the systems. Compressors, for example. Sometimes the engines are running at idle speed, but this is something that shouldn't be. So you could also have a lot of energy savings when it comes to the compressors and if the engines don't run idle. Let me ask you a question. Who of you has a sealed air pipe at their ski resort? Does anyone have a, seal, a sealed air pipe? Anyone has an air leak? No one? When it comes to air pipes, they need to be checked for leaks. Of course, the same applies to water. Because Leaks in the air pipe equal a loss in energy. This also applies to compressed air. Let's speak about reservoir ventilation. Usually, there are small compressors, and often in autumn, you turn on the ventilator and then there are bubbles and the compressor runs three to four thousand hours until it's springtime you turn it off again because it could be more efficient because usually you just would need the compressor for three to five hundred hours in temperatures that are really cold just in those situations 
when it's cold, too cold, and the temperatures are as low that the reservoir could freeze, so the run times could be controlled, and the new software versions in the engine rooms are able to switch the ventilation on and off by themselves automatically. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my speech. If you would like to speak about this in more detail, feel free to come to the booth of Techno Alpine and speak to us. Thank you very much, Markus. I have a provocative question. You said that one bar less air pressure could do could be such an improvement, but where why is eight bars the average? If seven bars would be enough. If all the air pipes are are sealed, on delivery, a compressor has the preset settings, and nobody questions the eight bars. So it's just the way it is. I think seven bars would be would be an idea to save a lot, and I think this is. There is a huge potential. Maybe the producing companies might think about having this as a preset function. And maybe this would also help stopping the bashing of the ski resorts because they're using so much energy. This would help reduce the energy consumption in the ski resorts. So that might be a good idea to if the compressors were delivered with a preset setting of seven bars of air pressure. We also have to speak about culture here, a culture of, well, we've also always done it this way, so we'll keep it this way. This culture should be questioned as well. We should try to seize the savings potential of each and every system. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move uh, straight on. He is already fading in from the right-hand side. A uh, warm welcome to Dr. Lukas Emberger, Managing Director of SCADI. He is going to speak about or give us in an insight into the resource management redefined, the digital skiing resource, what you can do with data. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you. The digital ski resort. That, of course, is a very broad term covering several different areas. And today, I would like to focus on the management of a ski resort, mainly because SCADI is a company that has developed a research management platform called SCADI that actually has its uh, fourth birthday or anniversary today. So maybe I should have raised my hand earlier when you asked about the birthday. So we presented it for the first time at Interalpine 2019. So and uh, already at that time, digital transformation had taken place uh, at uh, on the mountain. But what we've seen in the last few years, obviously, has accelerated digital transformation. And this do does not only apply to the management of a ski resort as such, but also for the hardware that is used. Inflation and the energy crisis, of course, have then, has then affected efficiency, effectiveness, and sustainability, and has made them, turned them into uh, very important topics and uh, 
So they have become a part of everyday decisions. And this is where SCADI, SCADI is coming into play. It's it should change and redefine the management of ski resorts by making um, them more sustainable, efficient, and effective. So, but what is SCADI? It is a resort management platform. So it is sort of the home of all software applications that you have in your ski area. One of our customers said that you can see SCADI as your personal assistant. It has all relevant information, gathers all pieces of information, stores them in at one place, and brings them together with all relevant analyses, thereby helping managers or people working at the front light um, making decisions more easily. And the fact that all information is stored at one place saves time already. SCADI is developed in a way that one account allows you to automatically uh, log on to all software applications that you have at your ski resort. So you don't have to log on to different platforms. There's one single sign-on, and that's it. SCADI was configured as an open platform, so you can integrate different software solutions, hardware solutions as well. There are no limits to integration. Integration is done via a standard interface, and this standard interface is currently supported by one uh, by some of the leading industry partners in the field and is also used by them um, such as uh, ropeway manufacturers and snow making manufacturers uh, it's a modular design uh, in order to give you maximum flexibility so over time, the platform is able to grow and the customer, the client can decide which software application he or she wants to integrate. So for example, uh, maintenance, you start with uh, the maintenance uh, plans and then you you integrate that those at first and then later on you also integrate all your ropeway applications. So the concept can grow over time. SCADI gives you an overview of uh, all relevant data at one glance because it accesses a permanently synchronizing database that has all relevant data information in real time. Uh, this means that you'll get alerts or push notifications in real time. We at SCADI wanted to have a playful design, something that is easy to use. We, of course, know that there are many other providers on the market uh, who have very technically and technologically um, advanced systems, but what we wanted to do is create an easy-to-use system. You don't need an AP to be an expert to be able to use it. We wanted to have a playful design and a user-friendly approach. And I think we've done quite a good job. And our customer feedback says that this is actually what uh, SCADI is all about. The teams accept it very quickly, and it's very easy to integrate it into everyday operations. We have two dis different display functions. On the left-hand side, you can see the widget view. So we have predefined fields that show you operational information about your infrastructure. For example, the status of your lifts or the fuel consumption of your fleet. It could be wind data and so on and so forth. So the user can customize the platform based on his or her individual requirements. So say you open the, the platform in the morning, and at one glance, you have all data that is relevant for you in this widget view. Here on the other side, you can see the global map view. So here you can see your ski resorts from a bird's eye perspective. 
and you'll get information about the current status of your infrastructure. So if you then click onto something, you can kind of zoom in and get additional information uh, on that particular asset you've zoomed into. So every user can use GPS data to also define and add objects, for example, anchor points, peace, restaurants, whatever you want. So all of these can be integrated into that global map view. So SCADI has also become a communication tool in many ski resorts. Why? Because all users access the same database, always based on uh, information rights that had been predefined. But basically, everybody sees the same thing. And because of that, it's very easy to communicate with each other, to document things, and to have smooth and efficient processes. And exchanging information and knowledge, of course, is facilitated greatly. One of our clients once said that now uh, we don't have any uh, handwritten, unreadable notes anymore at last, thanks to SCADI. So why SCADI? Five reasons. It's a one, uh, all-in-one solution, everything in one place. It offers maximum freedom because you can integrate everything. It gives you maximum flexibility because you can decide what you want to see. And it gives you an ideal basis for decision making because we work together with some of the industry leading partners and uh, this gives us a great uh, amount of data that enable you to take long term strategic decisions, informed decisions and then you can and based on this you can save resources and time and money of course so we also use um, applications from our partners that will be sent to you via our interface this applies to roadway management for example or, or fleet management and also snowmaking management. You've got different reporting functions, different reports that you can generate. And allow me very briefly to uh, go into more detail about a few applications that we developed. That's first of all the SCADI app. A user analysis has shown that more than 50% of users use SCADI on a mobile device, so on a smartphone or on a tablet. And therefore, SCADI has been optimized for use on mobile devices. The SCADI app can be accessed from everywhere all the time, so you'll get access to all relevant data whenever you want. And it offers all functionalities that also your PC would offer. Furthermore, you'll also get all alerts and push notifications onto your phone or onto your mobile device. We've also developed a maintenance tool over the last few years that uh, allows you to plan your maintenance for, say, roadways, uh, snowmakers, and so on and so forth. Maybe even the fire extinguishers. So all the maintenance plans can be automatically integrated and adjusted if need be. And maintenance activities that have been completed can be documented and all of this gives you an overview of um, completed and up to come maintenance activities. So I think we can definitely use this as economies of scale effects. And because everybody works with this software, everybody always has the same overview of uh, all maintenance activities at the ski resort. And we coupled this with a task manager. The task manager can create, distribute and track tasks. You can allocate tasks to certain people or also to objects. Why? 
So if you say are out in the field and you see an object and you see that something needs to be done, um, I can do it right away. And then you can have a look at the resource allocation and you can also provide uh, guidance and instructions for example, by providing images or um, voice recordings or by giving comments. And this tool improves and facilitates existing process greatly and uh, kind of replaces the post-its that now belong to the past. The applications are also available offline, so the workflow will not be impaired if you don't have an internet com connection. But as soon as you're connected again, the system will, system will automatically synchronize again. We now have a new application called SCADI Flow. We started uh, counting skiers at our ski pistes, 100% anonymously. And we were also tasked with counting tobogganers, hikers, uh, mountain bikers, and ideally also uh, cars at the parking spaces. And we can do that with our SCADI flow application in predefined areas. So we can count either people or cars there in these predefined areas. So this gives you quite a good insight into the usage of, say, different slopes or different parts of slopes. So, for example, there are two different ways to go down a piece, and then you get a clear overview of uh, how many people take the right slope and how many people take the left slopes. And based on this, you can take investment decisions, for example, or you can see how many people use your fun park on any given day. Um, but not only that, it's also closely linked to safety and security. For example, if there is a snow groomer grooming the, the piece in the dark, then the driver can be informed if there is still a skier running down the slopes after his upper ski. So it's about capacity use, but it's also about safety issues. We also have a logbook on a legally required um, provisions for roadways. So different stations, different employees can add their documentation into this logbook. They can do so in parallel. So you don't have co to collect different pieces of information from different points and people. But everybody can use the logbook to work at the same time. This obviously minimizes the effort required for us. And some of the um, data can be pre-filled. There are mandatory fields, there are instructions in order to minimize the risk of making mistakes. In Germany, Austria, and uh, Bolzano, the logbook has already been certified. And the last product that I would like to present to you is admittedly not yet in use in ski areas, but this will change next year or with the next season. I am speaking about our energy cockpit. The energy cockpit gathers information about the energy flow at the ski area, the energy consumption, but also energy generation, so that you can then see where is the energy going and where can uh, energy loss or waste be avoided. We currently have more than 400 customers worldwide who use SCADI. And we work closely together with partners of the industry, which helps us to continuously enhance and improve SCADI, combined with the valuable feedback that we get from our clients and customers. And therefore, I'm very confident that we are working in the right direction. If we have enough time, I would like to show you a short video about how SCADI can be used in real life. As Bruno just said earlier, 
precarious frage da muss nachher fragen gibt um, in order to avoid the precarious question of whether there are any questions i would like to suggest to you um, if you have any questions at all please visit us at uh, hall in hall number d at stand 10a me and my colleagues will be very happy to answer all the questions you might have and please let me now show the film to you Gut. Passt, dann schauen Sie sich den Film auf unserer Website. Okay, it's not working, so please uh, have a look at the video on our website or visit us at our stand. Thank you very much. Dear Lukas, thank you very, very much. I already thought that I had uh, developed a new product, but then you presented Scardi Flow to us. So tough luck for me, because of course, with all these data, you ultimately will ask yourselves how many people are actually in my ski resort. But let me ask you, how do you count um, people? If this is a, a business secret, then it's no problem. But that is something that I'm very interested in. Oh, no, that's, it's easy to explain that. that you can also test it at our stand. Um, we have an outdoor camera and an AI box that has a software in the background. You draw virtual lines where you want to count people or you predefine certain areas and they simply count the points. And the system can also see whether somebody goes uphill or downhill. So also mountain ski mountaineers can be counted. So it's re really 100% anonymous, yes. So no problem with uh, data protection or privacy. No, not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we started off with Switzerland, and we are now going to end with Switzerland. Let me introduce to you Jonas Moyli from Price Now. He is going to give us an insight into dynamic pricing in order for us to know how many visitors there are at our ski resorts and how many we can expect, how to deal with it, and how dynamic pricing is revolutionizing the mountaineering industry and the ropeway industry. Welcome to the final speech of this early afternoon. It was very exciting up to now, and I hope mine will be as interesting. I will use the next 20 minutes to show you how dynamic pricing is revolutionizing the mountain cable car industry. We have four questions today. The first one is, why should, should I be interested in dynamic pricing? How, how does it work for my cable car? What do I miss if I do not use dynamic pricing? And I think the fourth question, which is re really important, is what should I take into account when I use dynamic pricing? Let's start with the first question. Why should I care about dynamic pricing? We have been working with many customers for the past six years. We are working in pricing, e-commerce, and data analytics. And we realized in all of those projects that it is difficult to manage a ski resort and a mountain cable car. There are various challenges that have to be faced. Speaking about dynamic pricing, I think we need to see that dynamic pricing can help addressing various challenges. First, there is high fluctuation when it comes to demand. Why is that? There are various influential factors like um, seasonality, holidays, days of the week, and also snow conditions. So this results in varying demands throughout the season. Then there is the heterogeneous willingness to pay. What do I mean by that? Looking at the visitors 
and people booking ski tickets, not everybody is willing to pay the same price for a ticket. Why is that there are passionate skiers who would be willing to pay a higher price, maybe higher a price than you are charging today, but for others, this is also at a limit and they are having a hard time affording the ticket. You should take that into consideration when doing your pricing. However, over the season, the same people might not be willing to pay the same price every day. I think most of you are skiers as well, and you know that it's not the same experience every time. Maybe the weather is not as good. Of course, when the sun is shining, it's a great experience, and it is much more fun. So over the season, the willingness to pay fluctuates. The third aspect is logical, but it is important to mention. It is a perishable good, so to speak. You cannot sell the same ski day tomorrow. You can sell a ski, a ski equipment, on another day, but the ski ticket is only valid for one day, and you cannot sell it the next day. This needs to be considered in my price strategy. The fourth challenge are overhead costs. You have high overhead costs. You have high costs, and this is independent from the number of visitors in your ski resort. This is a high operative risk because those costs exist even if nobody turns up because the weather might not be as good. And last but not least, very often you do not know anything about your visitors. If the visitors come to your counter, you can say hi and wish them uh, fun on their ski day, but then you don't know anything about them. When this person returns and returns and returns, you don't know it's the same person because, well, you have many visitors. And if the person stops coming, it is difficult to communicate with this person because you do not know the person. And this is our aim, I think, having many people booking online so we can also know who our customers are. How does dynamic pricing work for my mountain cable car? This is my second question. I would like to show you the connection between fluctuating demand and pricing and varying price curves. I don't want to go into too much detail, but have a look at the left-hand side. Here you can see the curve of demand. And here on the horizontal line, there is the price. Each curve is represents one day in the season. At the bottom, there is a day with low demand. Maybe it's a low season. Maybe the weather isn't good. Here you have higher demands because maybe it's the high season. The curves are all falling. The higher the price, the less people are willing to buy a ticket. Of course, this makes sense, and this is reality. This is There is a negative connection here. On the right-hand side, we see the turnover here and also the price. These curves look differently, as you can see. I have five curves here. I took, I made a connection between the curves on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. Each of those demand curves are represented with a turnover curve on the right-hand side. We have to think about what the turnover means. I have sales volumes, tickets sold, times the price, then I have the turnover. Looking, looking at this day with the low demand, I start here at one euro. About 600 people will buy a ticket at one euro. 
With 600 euros, I'm here at the very bottom on the right-hand side. Making the price a bit more expensive, I earn more per ticket. I have more, a higher turnover. But at a certain price, people will stop buying the tickets. So towards the right, there comes a point when you reach a peak when it comes to the price. And if you increase the price further, you will lose money again because you will have fewer people buying your tickets. The aim is to be at the peak on each curve. The peak means that you have the best turnover. You try to find a price to maximize your turnover. Let's have a look at what did this means for static, pri for static pricing. Let's say you have a static price at 40 euros. Here you can see on the right-hand side where you land. You're never where the peak is. You're never at the right place. One day you are too expensive. You could be cheaper and you would have a higher turnover. And on another day, you are not expensive enough. You should be more expensive. This is something you need to know if demand fluctuates a lot and I don't consider it using a static price, I will not be able to maximize my potential. This is something that is true for all the industries. That is why dynamic pricing is happening everywhere. If I look at demand-based pricing, I have a certain price point set to, with the aim of maximizing the turnover. This is very theoretical. Let's have a look at a practical example. On the left-hand side, we see the demand on the left, and we see the season and the development throughout the season. Here you see some peaks on individual days a couple of more than 1,000 people buying one-day tickets. And you see that previously there was a static price. So you see on the peak days, the price was probably too high. And on the weaker days, the price was too high. So with dynamic pricing, you're able to react to this fluctuation. On the peak days, you create a higher price, and on the days with less demand, with lower demand, you lower the price. But you might think, well, there's more to this. Yes, you are right. This was our reaction to fluctuating demand. However, there are other challenges. Let's speak about high operative risk. So let's look at those five, six peak days. This is where you earn a lot of money. You know that. But what happens if those peak days do not exist? For example, if the weather is bad, because the overhead cost will still be very high, but the peak day turnover is not there anymore. And this is a risk that you, you have to carry. However, there is a solution. The solution is convincing your visitors, your customers to book early. You need to give an incentive to potential visitors so they book their tickets early. So this reduces your risk. So you can have different prices depending on when people book, so not on the day of validity, but beforehand. Let's have a look. This is the same curve, the price on the day of validity. And now I decide that I can sell a ticket at a lower price for early bookings. And I can justify the lower price because the customer helps me reducing my operative risk because this person has already bought a ticket. Let's have a three-dimensional 
illustration here. You see the peaks and the price development on the day of validity. But here you can also see the dimension of the day of booking. And you can see that we get closer and closer to the date of validity. On the date of validity, it is decisive what my expected demand looks like. So I have to be able to foresee when my peak day will be. Offering attractive prices here People will act. I want people to buy on certain days. And I can tell you, people will buy your tickets at those prices. But I have to make sure that I don't sell too many tickets at this price. This would be a mistake. This has happened before. It has to be dealt with carefully. Selling all the tickets at a cheaper price and all tickets for early bookers, I won't reach my price that I aim at. So I have to consider not only the demanded at the expected demand, but also the realized demand in the end. Both aspects have to be considered. So how does dynamic price pricing work for my mountain cable car? It's quite simple. You have to consider the expected demand and the realized demand. If you consider both aspects, you do a lot of things right. Let's deal with the third aspect. What do I miss if I do not use dynamic pricing? So what's in it for you? It is like a manager stream. You can increase turnover. You can reduce your efforts and also have to pay less because you have less employees, for example. So you have one strategy to deal with all challenges. In concrete terms, that means, well, we have many customers and they have stayed with us because they're very satisfied. And we experienced that we could realize an average price increase of 5 to 25 percent permanently. If you do dynamic prices, a pricing right, your average prices rise. We also were able to increase the sales volume. Have a look at the day ticket prices over the past 20 years or so. Why is that? Your costs are increasing, and of course, your guests have to pay for this. At a certain point in time, some visitors will not be able to afford the rising prices. But once you have a certain uh, margin, a certain range of prices, some people who don't have as much money might be able to still buy a ski ticket if they book early on. And later on, with a higher price, they wouldn't be able. So dynamic pricing helps offering prices that you might only know from the 90s, maybe. But of course, precondition is to book early on or not to come on a peak day. Maybe one of the most important KPI is turnover. We noticed a permanent increase of 8 to 22 percent for most of our customers. So permanent means it is not only in the first year. Our aim is to have a permanent increase. I can tell you this is the average increase in turnover um, from one from year one and I can tell you that in no of none of our cases this has decreased and this is a permanent increase that you will also experience in five years or later on and last but not least the online share 
is increased. Some customers experienced 30% um, online share and before they had no online bookings at all. Some of our customers experienced a, an online share of 60% or up to 80%. So maybe making an online shop more accessible even could also help. I do not want to only give you the numbers, but also some names. Here you can see Engadin, Flimslags, Montafon here in Austria. Some customers in Austria and Switzerland. Here you can see we have our partner in Lower Austria, EcoPlus. We implemented the system this year, this season. And next winter, we will be adding more projects with other customers. We can say this is not something brand new. We have been doing this for five years, and it's working. Let's get to the last question. How do I use dynamic pricing and what should I look out for? There are different systems. You can think about having your normal price and maybe you have a certain discount and after selling 100 tickets, you can raise the price a bit. This is a very simple discount system without looking at what the peak day of the year will be. be, And I don't think about very, the varying fluctuation. There is a system of rule-based pricing based on competitors as well. When it comes to skiing, there are many influential factors, weekdays, weather, snow conditions, and often it's a combination of various factors that decide on whether I go skiing or not. I wish you good luck if you want to define rules from that, because we're not only speaking about one-day tickets, but also like week tickets. There are different kinds of tickets. And it is very difficult to define a rule here. You need to focus on certain points. For example, you decide on weekends it will be more expensive than weekdays. I think, as was said before, data is our true gold, but it is only gold if you use the data. Using the data to make a forecast, use the data to see how many visitors you expect. I think this would be a good thing to find the perfect price for the perfect time. Data show us the influence of the weather. Not every day of the week. Well, on the weekend, for example, it doesn't matter what the weather is like, maybe. So the data help showing me detecting what is important for the pricing. The question is, where do you want to use the dynamic pricing? Maybe on, only online or also at the counter? Here you can see we have the sales channels, the points of sale, and then you have the data flow. I want to know if somebody bought a ticket because I need to know whether I need to increase the price because I have sold many tickets already. But I also want to know how many people have bought a ticket for a certain day, maybe the second Saturday in February. And it's interesting to know because before I didn't even know that this might be a peak day. So here we have the system that considers all of this data. Then we have external data, calendar, and weather data. 
Preisoptimierung und ich schreibe die wieder ein. This data is used to optimize the price and this calculated price goes back to the points of sale. So this means I need infrastructure and I need automation because I cannot do calculations manually every day. So I asked four questions and I want to give you short answers to those. Why should I care about dynamic pricing? I think it helps you address major challenges in your business model. How does dynamic pricing work for my mountain cable car? You see that if you consider the expected demand and the realized demand, you make a lot of things right. What do you miss? If, I, if you don't use dynamic pricing, I think then you miss the biggest driver of digitalization. If you optimize your turnover, you are at the top. You cannot get any higher. I think this is something that needs to be seized. We recommend data-based omnichannel dynamic pricing, why all points of sale and all sales channels. Think about it. If you are dynamic and in, in, one, in one aspect and static in the other, of course, you don't use the full potential. That's obvious. In Switzerland, eight of ten of the largest ski resorts have implemented dynamic pricing. And I think in Austria, we'll, we will make the same experience and it will go very fast. So this brings me to the end. I have a highlight, a highlight that I brought with me, sweets from Switzerland. You have been listening to me all this time. I brought Toblerone chocolate. Why did I do that? I would like you to take something home with you. My colleagues will hand out those chocolates to you at the exit. But this is not the only thing that we want to give you. We want you to take this to remind you of looking at your sold tickets, day tickets, in your ski resort the last couple of days this season. And if it looks a bit like the Toblerone, you see that there is a peak, and this peak needs to be used for your dynamic pricing system. Thank you very much for your attention, and enjoy the chocolate. Thank you very much, Jonas. So eat a corn of Toblerone, as we heard in the commercials earlier. So we can use or eat a corner of uh, dynamic pricing now as well. So we are already behind schedule, but just very briefly, why do you think has it taken so long for dynamic pricing to be implemented at ski resorts? Because it's nothing new. Aviation, for example, has used it for a long time. The 92% that we heard about already today, was that the reason or was it something else? Well, it's a good question. We were here already four years ago, given a similar presentation. Many things have changed since then, but to before, as a roadway provider, you've been confronted with the pandemic in the last few years. And that, of course, has also meant that many um, uh, have started to take digitalization more seriously, and I think that has helped a lot. I cannot give you a specific answer to what, as, as to why it has taken so long, but the longer you think about it, the more you will see that it actually makes sense. I've been thinking about it for about 10 years now, and I am more convinced uh, of dynamic pricing than ever. So And, and it's, it's working everywhere, as I said before. So I think we've given you a lot of food for thought while eating Toblerone. But before that, you will get a 
com comedic musical summary of the second session. So again, Marcus Linda, who has critically analyzed all the data of this afternoon session and will now give us a musical summary of session number two. Dear Marcus, the floor is yours. Wieder nach den Keynote Speakern, der Keynote Player, Jörg Brandt von Roll Infratech. Er hat uns interessante Dinge gesagt. Please show me the way to zero water loss. Jörg, you're the boss. Ja, was ist da los? Please show me the way to strategisch H2O. Übers Wasser raus am Hana, da bin ich wirklich froh. Und er hat gesagt, lieber ungefähr richtig als haargenau falsch. Bad about right, then precisely wrong. Da wär net, wenn die verbleibenden Shubi Dui, Shubi Dua. I say bad about right, then precisely wrong. <laughs> Lieber halbwegs richtig als völlig falsch, put it on. Aber es gibt Hoffnung, hat Jürg Brand gesagt. Es geht um den Mindset. Dieses Mindset macht aus Krise Wasserschance, ja Wasserschance. Dieses Mindset gibt uns Wasserschance. Dieses Mindset macht aus Krise Wasserschance, ja Wasserschance. Dieses Mindset macht aus Krise Chance. Ein Applaus für Jürg Brand. Es sprachen Monika Oblonczek und Andreas Czauna von AWS und Auvaria. Und da fiel ein Wort ganz auf. Data is more than a trend. Data, da, 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 Modell, das jeder kennt. Die Data, die Data, data-driven business. Die data, da, da, macht uns besser ohne Stress. Da, 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 dann haben sie gesungen, über die Challenges haben sie gesprochen. Scalability. Die checkt ich bisher nie. Ich spiele den Saal leer, meine Damen und Herren. Ein Applaus für Monika Oblonczek und Andreas Czauner. Markus Pfeiffer war hier von Techno Alpin. Give me the key to the data highway. I'm rasen dahin. Da kann ich alles checken. Ja, da bin ich drin. One more time. Give me the key to the data highway. Das, das geht sehr schnell. Da können wir gut planen und sind top aktuell. Ich habe erfahren, dass es ein neues, eine Sache gibt, die ich beim Hausbau noch nie gesehen habe, nämlich die Temperaturfenster. Temperaturfenster öffne ich rapid. Diese Fenster nütze ich, das ist ein Hit. Temperaturfenster, ich fensterle sehr gern. Diese Fenster sind von einem anderen Stern. Ein Applaus für Markus Pfeiffer. Lukas Imberger Skadi. Perfekt wedeln kann. Digital Ski Resort. Und dann komme ich ins Rappen. Bumm, 
chuck, ba doom ba doom chuck, go to boom to chuck, ba doom boom chuck. Real time information, optimized information flow, dashboards and widgets, global data and so be so. So ba doom so ba doom chuck, go to boom boom chuck, ba doom ba doom so 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 so. Yet all. Super Stimmung im Saal. Bum, check, bum, bum, check. Offline Functionality, Maintenance Overview, Task Manager, good to see, der gibt niemals Ruhe. Ein Applaus für Lukas Emberger. Und last but not least, Jonas Mauli von Price Now. I'm pricing in the snow. Dynamic pricing in the snow. Wie viel will jeder zahlen? Das beschäftigt mich so. Und alle singen, I'm pricing in the snow. I'm Und ganz zum Schluss möchte ich noch Reinhard Fendrich zitieren. Bin Nachfrage basiert, Madame. Der Umsatz maximiert, Madame. Preissetzung garantiert, Madame. Das schaue ich mir mit Dynamic Pricing an. Ein Applaus für Jonas Mauli. Dankeschön. Lieber Markus. Dear Markus, a perfect summary. Uh, I couldn't do it any better, but I wouldn't want to. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I know we're behind schedule, but we are trying to improve. So I'd be happy to see you again at 3.30 for the last session of today about sustainability in Alpine tourism. And then we will be on time. Until then, I will have learned to be on time. But there's been a lot of content, and of course, we need a lot of time to discuss it. Thank you very much. I see you later. Thank you.
Meine sehr verehrten Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you to session three of the Interalpine Inspiration Days. We will now speak of what's most likely the most sensitive issue or topics of all um, topics that we've tackled so far, and that's sustainability in alpine tourism. In the last few weeks, we heard a great deal about ski resort bashing. So what does that mean? So people criticized uh, the pollution. Does skiing still exist? Does it make sense at all? Why do we have uh, events like this and so on and so forth? And therefore, we consider it to be important to have this very session here today and to discuss with some of the leaders of the industry on the one hand, but also from research and application um, about sustainability and about what has already been achieved. And later on, we will have a panel discussion with five representatives of uh, universities and companies. And together with them, we will speak about different questions and topics related to sustainability. So allow me at this point to hand over to Professor Dr. Eichels from the Technical University of Graz in Austria. He works at the Institute for Thermodynamics and Sustainable Propulsion Systems. A warm welcome to you. You know how the cookie crumbles, you know how the drives works. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Sie haben es angesprochen, das Thema. Sustainability, as you said, it's, there's been a lot of debate about it, and especially in association and uh, based on drive systems. And I'm very happy to speak about something that usually is not based with a lot, uh, not, not discussed with a lot of facts, but usually based on emotions. What will I do in the next 20 minutes? First of all, I would like to speak about the motivations and challenges related to alpine areas. Um, based on the example of um, car um, drives. And then I will speak about uh, battery electric drives, fuel cells, and the combustion engine. So electrified, partly electrified, and also alternative uh, fuel-based um, engines. So these are the potential concepts before I will then speak about and outline several specific examples and do a summary. Looking at drive systems, there are different motivations and criteria to develop new drives, many of which are similar um, in terms of, say, performance. That's an important criterion. Uh, reliability and the life cycle. It becomes a little more tricky when we look into the uh, required infrastructure. The price is important for the manufacturers and also developing costs and times. What, when is a product mature for, uh, mar for the market? So what about the cost of manufacturing and also about the costs later on? These criteria are dominated by the topic of emissions, but I would like to differentiate between climate relevant and greenhouse gas relevant emissions and other emissions. And then also res resources, so the in terms of costs, but also in terms of the footprint. What are the overall conditions? Um, they have been discussed over and over again. When it comes to winter sports and Especially there, we need to um, to reduce so in order to reach a net zero by 2015. A term that I find important important to mention is uh, the emission level in leisure areas. If if it's not zero, then we need to reach a level that's called zero impact level. So it's usually lower than three percent of what. Uh, emissions concentration of emission concentrations and the challenges for us usually refer to the fact that it's a natural area that might be in high altitudes that's of course a challenge then partly low temperatures and also a high performance requirements to sum up there are three options 
You might have heard about some of them. Battery electric is locally emission free, has a high efficiency grade, but a low storage density. Charging times are an issue and so are the costs. But I will come back to all of them later on. In terms of the fuel cell, the, we can say that it's also locally emission free. Uh, there is a CO2 free drive with the storage density and refueling times that we are familiar with. Similar to liquid hydrocarbons today and infrastructure and cost of course are a big challenge. And then we have the combustion engine a, um, hybrid form. It's uh, a proven technology, very robust and can use renewable fuels, which allows for defossilization. It has a high energy density, but uh, in terms of challenges, we see we can name emissions and the efficiency grade as great challenges. So in more detail, assuming that everything must be based on renewable energies, then I would like to give you the example of a car drives, so to let you know where the electricity comes from. So the public opinion usually states um, battery electric will be the overall solution. I don't quite agree, but that's the mindset of many, many people. And then there is a second option, the electrolysis. So you can uh, generate um, hydrogen with electricity. Of course, this, uh, there is a loss of efficiency. Uh, usually, um, uh, we achieve about 65 to 70 percent of efficiency for hydrogen generation. But the renewable energy needs to be stored, and that, of course, is very difficult when it comes to electricity. Um, we can that, then use a combustion engine or a fuel cell to drive a vehicle. And then there's a third option. In an additional synthesis step after electrolysis, we can use CO2 from uh, the air or industrial process and generate fuels. And that can then be used through the existing distribution net. Of course, uh, when using it, there is a loss of efficiency. And that is, uh, and usually we achieve about 50% of efficiency. The problem here is that the existing infrastructure in, um, that we can use the existing infrastructure and uh, backward compatibility. Currently, we have 1,300 million vehicles on the world, and uh, there will be an extra 80 million. Looking at the life cycles, about 15 years, then we can imagine that it won't be possible without that, at least, if you ask me. Especially when it comes uh, for high performance areas where I need a lot of energy. So alternative drives are sometimes called to be something very new. But in Austria, we can proudly say that uh, we look back at a long history. Uh, here you can see an example of Porsche from 1900. And the batteries weighed more than one ton, so it was quite heavy. And later, they introduced hybrid vehicles uh, in 1902 for races. And we should also mention the fuel cell vehicle that uh, has already been the topic of research at the early stage at the Technik University of Graz, which I'm very proud of. So let me now outline potential concepts and their specific characteristics, beginning with the following. If you burn um, hydrocarbon, then uh, you produce CO2. If you have electric um, electricity, then you have uh, zero emissions. Everybody will agree, but then uh, you might also say, no, that's not quite right. But the legislature it treats it in that ex exact way. It's uh, what we call a tank-to-wheel approach. And this is part of our current legal framework. What is not included is how this electric energy is being provided. And this needs to be taken seriously for climate approaches. So we need a well-to-wheel consideration. And actually, we should do a cradle-to-grave calculation and um, look at the system from that perspective. 
So what are the differences in terms of cars? Here you can see on the upper level, on the upper line, what the legislator uh, calculate in terms of the different um, fields that you can see here. Here you can see the two of them um, are, have zero CO2 um, emissions. Here, uh, 100 grams and plug-in has a lot less, according to the legislator. If you do a life cycle um, analysis, then um, we see that the differences are not as different or as large as we can see here. What I'm trying to say here is that we have to have an overall look at everything if we really want to look at it from a climate change perspective. This brings me to the battery storage. Uh, it's a not a favorable option uh, in terms of energy density. It achieves a high efficiency grade, however. Um, but this is a logarithmic measurement. So there is quite a difference between the different densities. And hydrogen is, or can also be found in between. So it's also not at the level that we know from hydrocarbons. So some applications have a question marks when it comes to battery electric mobility, especially when it comes to heavy duty vehicles. And not only when it comes to storage, costs and weight, but also in terms of energy supply and provision. If we have liquid carbon um, hydrant today, say refueling at a gas station, uh, then we achieve a, an additional performance of 36,000 kilowatts. So with one minute of refueling, you can go quite a way for about 40 kilowatts. This is what a tractor usually needs. So it's not really a very um, high number. But if a truck or a tractor can charge with 22 kilowatts, so with a three-phase current, then we won't get very far. And if we want to have a high-performance charging system, superchargers, the, so charging at 300 kilowatts, then we only have six minutes of operation. So, of course, we can try and introduce megawatt charging, but even then, the performance might not be what we need uh, for heavy-duty vehicles, for example. So the options are limited for heavier vehicles. So the advantage of battery electric drives is definitely the high efficiency grade from if you look at the tank to wheel. It's um, locally emission free and there are few moving parts and uh, not a lot of noise. On the other hand, we need to mention the range and the storage capacity as a disadvantages. The cost and the weights are significantly higher. I can't really say anything about the cost potential because I'm not an expert. Uh, low um, surrounding temperatures are definitely a critical issue, as is the infrastructure. And the electricity generation is, of course, very important in terms of environmental compatibility. So for Alpine application, it is favorable and useful if I need only low performances with low energy requirements. So then I can use battery electric electric drives and can live with the disadvantages. Let us now look into the fuel cell. So we combine hydrogen and uh, oxygen from the air. And in a chemical process, we um, generate fuel. And the chemical processes are strongly dependent on the temperatures. So freezing is an issue here. But it sounds very trivial, but definitely we need to consider this as an issue. This is what it looks like. You don't have to learn the formula by heart. I won't uh, test you on this. So this is the application in passenger cars. So you can buy cars like this, and they work quite OK. So how are they built? In addition to the hydrogen um, storage, which is uh, bigger, of course, 
it uh, is combined with a battery. Why? Because we want to recuperate and the fuel cell doesn't like to have high performance dynamics and the rest is then done by the battery. The concepts are, of course, a bit different um, from each other. Here you have an RX-35. Here you can see the storage capacity and the drive system of a fuel cell stack, so several bipolar plates on top of each other, and an electric drive unit and the battery. So this works in passenger cars. But in the Alpine region, we have to ask, what are our framework conditions? So let's look at the efficiency levels of uh, the fuel cell. The disadvantage is that at low um, capacities, the efficiency is high. And the combustion engine is here not a good idea. But it's, be it's not good, but it becomes better. And so the absolute efficiencies need always always need to be treated with a bit of a grain of salt. So, but what does that mean for us specifically? A car uh, has usually lower loads. So, and you can usually not use it uh, normal road traffic. So, the fuel cell is um, very is much better with the, than diesel um, engine. This is one of the advantages, but when it comes to heavy-duty operations, the story is quite different. They are quite similar in terms of efficiency, but we need to bear in mind that the fuel cell um, does not have a high um, output temperature. So the 50% that we are lacking here, or whatever it is, needs to have a temperature of uh, 80 degrees. So the cooling is one of the challenges, even for winter sports, which might, which might come as a surprise for you. So again, summing up, um, so CO2-free um, drive is possible. It's locally emission-free, no moving parts, and uh, low in noise pollution. The disadvantages are the cost, uh, cost potential, again, with a question mark, and the infrastructure is required. So it's possible to provide it, but it's a challenge. Compared to cars, where it works well, trucks and especially snow groomers um, need to bear the uh, robust, uh, the, the issue of robustness in, in, uh, into account. So there is still potential or, for development. In generating um, hydrogen is an important issue for climate protection because about 95% uh, uh, of hydrogen produced worldwide are used during using are produced using um, steam generation. But the great advantage is that I can uh, store regenerative energy, and that's a huge advantage of the fuel cell. So this technology bears a lot of potential. Um, there is still room for improvement before it will become serially mature. And this now brings me to the combustion engine. This is what it can look like. It's a vehicle with hydraulic um, uh, aggregates um, that power it. I can do that with e-fuels, for example. This is a typical drive. But I can also electrify it using a serial drive in with different grades. For example, limit um, aggregates can be electrified, but I can also have central hydraulic pumps that are electrified. And uh, it can become even more complex. So an electrified uh, drive does not is not the same as another electrified drive. That's what I'm trying to say here. So the um, combustion engine can use uh, different fuels um, based on exhaustible sources, but also on regenerative sources. And that, of course, is then a huge advantage. advantage. The fuel cell needs um, a very pure hydrogen um, graded 5.0. 99.99% need to be pure. 
because pollution is obviously not good. And we are working on the different applications for um, combustion engines. And I would like to give you some examples. We developed a hydrogen um, engine for a, in a, a big company, and the CEO wanted, wanted it to work also under robust um, conditions. And here, just to give you an idea of how it works in terms of development, so you can see what's going on or hear. But it works fine. So summing up again, the advantages are the following. So it can use different fuels. It can be CO2 low or free. It can be electrified in different ways with the uh, familiar advantages in terms of uh, range and uh, refueling times, it's robust and cost efficient, and I can use existing vehicle structures, which from an economical perspective is of course a great advantage. But there are also disadvantages. It has a limited efficiency grade. Um, it is not an absolute zero um, op uh, emission option, but we can bring it down to a zero impact level. And this has been proven. So my conclusion is that for Alpine applications, at least in the medium term, this is going to be the best option for medium or high energy and performance requirements. And I would like to conclude with several specifically selected examples. They are in the prototype phase or an early serial phase. So here we have battery electric vehicles from both the, from the two big manufacturers. The um, performance requirements are obviously high for these uh, vehicles. A serial hybrid drive is also already in use with an electric drive of the wheels and also auxiliary units partly parts of which are electrified. In the demo project, hydrogen, the hydrogen combustion engine and the fuel cell, which are currently being demonstrated. So there are several good approaches that, however, have not yet reached market maturity yet. You might be familiar with this project, the High Snow Project, um, which receives public um, subsidies, subsidies to, to reduce emissions in winter tourism. This is being implemented in Upper Austria, where they use photovoltaic, and there is a gas station. Then you can see a skeeter here that's been developed in Graz using a fuel cell, interestingly enough. So here just a few impressions of the research work that's being done there. So this is what a decarbonized, uh, what decarbonized winter sports could look like. And this already brings me to the end of my presentation. So just summing up very briefly, what's essential for the drives are the regulatory conditions and provisions. So in terms of drugs, fuels that does not contain carbon is seen as CO2 neutral, regardless of how it's generated. For cars, the situation is different. So if there is only one CO2 particle in there, then it's not a zero emission vehicle. So it shows that it's not quite matured yet. So it's going to be interesting to see what the future has in store. But this will definitely have an impact on uh, what kind of drive systems you want to choose. So the cost of ownership obviously are important as well. So there is going to be an ever more diverse um, range of application for the future. I don't think anyone can afford not to look into this at all. And there are different concepts that are favorable in terms of application, so the electrified um, combustion engine with alternative fuels, so HVO, for example, e-fuels or hydrogen. 
They can be CO2 neutral and they are robust and um, have good uh, manufacturing conditions and so on and so forth. So they can certainly have an impact. Uh, the fuel cell, I think, is a solution for the medium to long term. I am a huge fan of the fuel cell, don't get me wrong. So they are in strong competition with the combustion engine. But I think there is still work to be done until it can also achieve high performance capacities. And battery electric drives can be used wherever the performance uh, requirements are low and if the storage capacity is sufficient. So in terms of environmental co um, compatibility, we can say everything is dependent on the provision of the uh, energy. And the key question is not the converter at the end, but how the question, how is this energy created and generated? Is it generated in a renewable way or not? So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions at all, I think we can, we'll be able to answer them during the panel discussion. Thank you. Professor Eichels, Eichels, thank you very much for these explanations. I think this, your presentation has been an eye-opener to us. As you said, we'll answer all the questions, hopefully, uh, during the panel discussions with all our participants, all our panelists. And this brings us to the next topic, to our next speaker. From Sweden, working for Biofuel, is their strategic key account manager, and she will tell us with Swedish charm, how biofuel, what it is, how it works, for what it, and how it can be used. Line, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruno. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure being here today and addressing you on my two favorite topics, which are skiing and sustainability combined. So, um, I, my name is Lena Norberg, uh, and I represent company Biofuel Express. As the name suggests, we, uh, we distribute uh, all kinds of biofuels, uh, especially the, uh, now we have focus on the second generation. And uh, uh, these products can be used in, in, in principle everywhere where fossil oil is uh, used so for, to replace that uh, in order to bring emissions down. So from uh, trucks, buses, snow groomers, uh, to uh, production uh, facilities, to, for heating of the buildings, and even for power plants for uh, producing green electricity. So why is it important with sustain sustainability of the uh, ski resorts? Uh, these are, of course, the economic engines of the local communities, and uh, which are uh, severely affected by the climate change. Uh, own operations are still very carbon intensive, and the uh, main climate impact comes from uh, what we call scope 3 emissions or, uh, or indirect emissions. So, uh, in a way, uh, all of that can be uh, uh, tackled by, uh, by the use of our products. So, uh, sustainability in the, uh, sustainable industry trends, we have seen that uh, uh, they, it, they have kind of helping to, for, the, uh, for the industry to develop, and um, uh, this is uh, increasing post-pandemic uh, traveling, growing interest for sustainable tourism, for outdoor activities, and growing uh, renting and sharing economy, which is everything is uh, uh, helping for the industry to grow further, but it has to grow sustainably, so uh, there, there have to come solutions, materials, products, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, em emit less. Uh, here I would like to present an like example of a decarbonization roadmap for, uh, map for the industry. And uh, first of all, uh, the quickest and easiest solution is to replace uh, all the fossil uh, oil with uh, renewables. And uh, thus uh, you can uh, uh, take away the direct emissions. Uh, sustainable mobility, mobility going to and forth from, from the resorts. Uh, uh, here you can uh, build partnerships with, uh, for example, public transport operators in order to uh, bring the emissions down, even the indirect ones. 
uh, and uh, engaging in procurement and purchasing with focused and zero uh, and low carbon intensity uh, solutions. Again, uh, the indirect emissions. And what uh, many of uh, you are already doing, green power, energy efficiency, recycling and, and reducing. Uh, but my focus today is on renewable fuels and, uh, 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 and the slogan we use often is fossil free in five minutes. And why is it five minutes? It's usually the time it takes to fuel a bigger vehicle. A uh, sustainable alternative to fossil, fuel, uh, fossil oil, uh, as I mentioned before, there are many different applications uh, for use of uh, renewable fuels. It's not just uh, 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 using in, uh, internal combustion engines. For example, uh, if you take uh, the ski resort, the snow groomers and service vehicles, even the diesel generators, heating of the buildings, and uh, also the public transport uh, to and forth, um, so, and even it can be used in personal cars if the, there is an internal combustion engine involved. Uh, so it's a, an available solution which is available already to, uh, today. It's an affordable, com co if you compare with investments needed for to, to convert to different technology, uh, and it's commercially feasible. So no new infrastructure is needed. Um, and no engine uh, modifications, so it works perfectly with the existing diesel engines. So the product uh, we are uh, presenting here uh, is HVO100, and HVO uh, stands uh, for hydro-treated vegetable oil, even though the feedstock we use is nothing but uh, uh, vegetable oil. It's the second generation uh, waste and residues. And it's a superior quality uh, renewable diesel. So first of all, it's 100% renewable, uh, as I mentioned, made from waste and uh, residues. Uh, it's the highest diesel quality worldwide on the market, so it's really pure. And uh, it's compatible with all the existing uh, diesel engines. Um, it's less toxic than the, uh, the fossil counterpart, uh, and uh, uh, it's not uh, dangerous for, for the environment. It's totally odorless, so you, so you slip this, uh, um, this fantastic diesel odor in the paste, so, so it's, it has no, no color, no, no smell. Um, it has superior cold properties, uh, so you can use it down to 35 minus without a problem. It's been tested and used above the Arctic Circle in the Nordic countries without any problems. And it's also the only, uh, uh, only product that can uh, replace the fossil uh, avi aviation fuel and can be used in, in, uh, in, in, in engines. Uh, thanks to the high SETI number, uh, you have a really quick cold start that's saving uh, uh, a lot of fuel. So, but the most, the most important uh, advantage of this product is the environmental properties. Uh, by switching to HVO, you can bring your emissions down to uh, with 90%, up to 90%. Using waste and residue as feedstock, it's from 85 to over 90% compared to the fossil alternative. And also, uh, the local emissions uh, get uh, decreased, uh, as you see, uh, particles, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbon, and uh, carbon monoxide. So, as I mentioned, it's, it's non-toxic and not, it's not harmful for the environment. And it's just to use it. A very interesting part about uh, the product is what is it made of uh, instead of uh, fossil crude oil. So it's a variety of, the, uh, of feedstocks uh, currently uh, available and uh, what uh, are used now uh, to produce the product uh, that's uh, used cooking oil. Uh, it's collected from the restaurants worldwide and used as a resource to, 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 uh, to produce the product. Uh, it's uh, waste animal fats, uh, uh, not suitable for human consumption. So every, basically everything that you throw, you can use um, uh, for, for making the fuel off uh, if it's rich with uh, fatty acids. 
uh, rest uh, product from fish uh, fishing industry um, and uh, also in some markets even technical corn oil which is a, a waste product from ethanol production in the future, we get a lot of the questions, is there enough, uh, will there be enough of feedstock? Uh, we are working on it and our partners are working on it. So from five to ten years perspective, uh, the following feedstocks will be uh, available commercially and uh, which will make the, 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 uh, the possibility to scale up the production uh, by multiplying this several times. And that is uh, waste plastics. Uh, we know this is not a renewable resource, but the problem in the world with waste plastics is so huge that if you can use it, for creating something that you can use again, thus bringing the emissions down, we see that in any way as a, uh, as a, as a good uh, uh, feedstock. Lignocellulosics, uh, waste material for, for example, forestry industry, also uh, a potentially um, scalable um, uh, feedstock, then, which is very interesting, municipal waste. Only 13% of the waste globally is recycled today. And uh, as you see in the bubble there, uh, according to the projection of uh, uh, World Bank, uh, um, uh, the uh, municipal waste will grow to 3.4 billion tons globally by 2050. If we don't do something about it, we will all drown in waste. So that is potential uh, feedstock to you, uh, produce the product of. And uh, if it's uh, properly uh, uh, sorted and, and managed, uh, it can be a valuable resource. For example, to, to, to use as a fuel in the engine, uh, in the end. Um, uh, CO2 absorbing microalgae, it's also a very, very interesting feedstock we, uh, we are looking into. And that will be available like in five uh, to seven years time, commercially uh, scalable. Uh, and last but not least, C uh, carbon dioxide itself as a feedstock. So very interesting, it's the power to x technology and, and uh, you, you um, uh, use carbon dioxide and renewable electricity and then you can produce uh, the fuel that can be used in the existing engines. So the timeline is down there, so five to ten years uh, of all these different kinds of uh, future feedstocks. But at the, at the moment, uh, it's mostly um, um, uh, animal fat and used cooking oil. So, uh, uh, in the Nordic region, we haven't explored if, uh, the world yet, but uh, we have uh, been the first company to make all this life cycle analysis uh, and all the data from, from the uh, product's life cycle available to our customers. And this is really um, uh, appreciated for those companies who, uh, who are looking into decreasing their carbon pr footprint. So, from this customer portal, they have all the data available from uh, where the product is uh, uh, coming from, what is that, for, uh, what, what feedstock has been used, uh, and where the feedstock is coming from. So you can trace all the way back to feeds, the feedstock's origin and see how much carbon dioxide or equivalents uh, is uh, created in every step of the chain. Uh, so if you want to work with sustainability seriously and you have that ambition, you need to have control of the data. And this is uh, what we also um, uh, do. So my, first, my last slide, uh, enable the change because the means is, are here and, and the solu and solutions or part of the solution is available. So make renewable fuels accessible and that you can do a, in cooperation with your lo local fossil free fuel distributor. Uh, uh, who will also guarantee volume and quality, so it has to be right quality for uh, of, of feedstock in order to it to really be sustainable, uh, and uh, also ensure the transparency and credibility of, of uh, sustainability data. Uh, many companies just use the industry averages. Uh, unfortunately, it's not good enough. You have to know exactly how much uh, carbon it, it creates and then you can efficiently manage that. And last but not the least, uh, it's the visitor 
you have to engage with because that's where, where the change starts. It changes with the mind, mindset change and it starts with the behavioral change. Thank you very much. And my last question is, when are you becoming fossil free? Will it be 2045 or will it be at 2045? Thank you very much. <laughs> Lene, thanks very much for coming yes. the long way from Sweden to us to tell us how valuable waste, uh, organic it waste in particular, can be and how it can be used. We will have a few more questions in the upcoming podiums discussion. Please have a seat for the moment. Uh, darf ich auf Deutsch wechseln? Wir kommen nun zum letzten Punkt des That brings me to the last point of today, the panel discussion. You already got to know two participants, but in addition to Professor Eichelseder and, and Ms. Norberg, I would like to introduce the president of Schmidtenhöhenbahn AG, Mr. Meyer, Mr. Vollbert, president of Oberstdorf Bergbahnen Mountain Cableways, and the president of the German cable car industry and Mr. Oberwinkler, CTO of Käsbohrer Geländefahrzeug. May I ask you to join me on the stage? I would like Ms. Norberg to sit on the very right side, so she has no disturbance here and can hear the interpreters. Yeah, here, show this guy in. Einmal, ah, this, come on, so da. I darf mir erlauben, mit jenen Herrschaften zu fangen. I would like to start with those of you who were not able to speak before. Mr. Meyer, you are the CEO of a very interesting company. It's not only a cableway, but also a nautical company. What is your opinion on the future? What is Schmittenhöhenbahn doing when it comes to your future and sustainability. Thank you for having me, first of all. Your question is interesting. Schmittenhöhebahn is the oldest cableway in Salzburg region. It was built in 1927. Back then, we had an electric engine already, although there was no electricity, so the first 10 years we used diesel diesel engine. We have been dealing with the topic of mobility for a long time. And of course, the past couple of years, we focused more on it. We are the only EMAS eco-management and auditing certification. This is a challenge for us, but also opens some doors for us to keep this certification. We use a lot of electricity, of course. We buy electric energy from sustainable, renewable sources. But of course, we have combustion engines as well. When it comes to our groomers and also to our ships, we have three hybrid groomers that we are using, and we are trying to optimize our processes. Fifteen years ago, we started a project together with the University of Vienna and with Kesbohrer, a project using a, a groomer that is driven by electric engines. But of course, it is not always easy to implement a new process in existing infrastructures. 
When it comes to our ships, they basically have normal combustion engines. As a first step, we focused on gas to liquid, synthetical kind of fuel, odorless, colorless. There are now some certificates that can be achieved, but that's not all. We heard about HVO before that can be used for slow rumors and about alternative engines. This is, of course, challenging when it comes to low temperatures and infrastructures that are in place. Mr. Folbert, I would like to ask you the next question. Before we spoke about commercial aspects, we heard about new engines, new fuels. What do you say about it from a commercial perspective? How can a ski resort become green? Hello. My name is Hendrik Volsberg. From a commercial perspective, I have to say that the groomers are always too expensive. They use way too much diesel, all of them, so everything needs to become more cost effective, basically. So everybody understands what I'm saying here, absolutely. Well, I think there are two dimensions from a commercial perspective. First of all, how do I generate turnover and how do I deal with the costs? Our company is about 100 years old. We are located at the border between Bavaria and Tyrol. We are an all-year-round destination. In winter, we have many groomers, I think 35 groomers and 80 other vehicles that we have to fuel. Everything is about being efficient. We need to find out what technology can be affordable in the future, because I can have the modern um, technology, but it also has to be economically feasible. How do I get the fuels that I want to use up the mountain? Do I have to have various options in use at the same time? We need industrial standards that are simple and can work as simple as it, they work with diesel fuels at the moment. But I am convinced that sustainability and credibility in sustainability is not only a must-have, but it goes without saying from the perspective of our visitors. And if we cannot meet this demand in the next 10 years, I think we are doing something wrong. This is essential. We are doing everything in our power to make the shift that is necessary. We need our suppliers and we need the whole industry to help us. Decarbonization is important. It needs to be affordable and we need to convey this to our customers in a transparent way. The shift to ecological electricity, for example, from renewable energies is the first step that we were taking, but as a next step for us was a shift to HVO. We used about 600,000 liters of diesel before, but last winter we used the HVO. Because, of course, it costs us more because it's more expensive, but we believe that there is added value you from the sustainability aspect from it. So it's worth it. Dr. Oberwinkler, what does Kesbohrer, as a producer of, among other things, groomers, say to that? What is your opinion? I do not want to speak about the costs. So what 
technologies does Casebocher produce here? We spoke a lot about alternative drives, which for us is only one component when it comes to sustainability. We provide solutions for sustainable and efficient slope management. For us, there are various components that are part of this process. Digitalization is part of it. How can we use the data that we collect to make ski resort management more efficient? How can our operators and drivers prepare the slopes in an optimized way? How can we use the engines and spare parts as efficiently as possible? The better the maintenance, the more cost efficient we can work. Then it's about how do we use the powertrains in the most efficient way. When it comes to alternative powertrains, we have to say this is the future for us, the alternatives. There are discussions with decision makers. There are legal frameworks that, well, are a certain framework that are challenging for us. It is quite complicated if you want to make trials with hydrogen. When it comes to suppliers, there is the technological aspect. We need technology from the suppliers. They need to provide a certain infrastructure, for example, when it comes to hydrogen, but also availability of alternative fuels. We heard a lot about HVO today already, but we're also all speaking about e-fuels. They're all across the media. So those are aspects when it comes to suppliers. In the last days, we had an exchange with our customers, and we saw that it is very important to be open-minded here when it comes to alternative energy. In our field, we see HVO as a very good and basically the only alternative for a CO2 neutral drive for our groomers. We also started prototypes with other um, electric drives, battery electric drives, with other modern combustion engine mode, uh, engines. Um, we are basically open-minded when it comes to all kinds of alternatives. You have a new big baby, the, the Model 800, that is also already running with a hydrogen engine, is that right? The engine can be integrated easily. But, of course, we also need the hydrogen infrastructure on the side of our, of our suppliers. We need the correct legal framework. We need to have green hydrogen available. So there's a whole package of things that we need. We also in our development segment, we say we are ready for hydrogen if our customers are. Professor eichel Seda, we heard a lot about uh, the um, fuel cell and the energy balance. Will the energy balance considerably improve? You've got a microphone. Yeah, I hope you can hear me, okay? The energy balance will improve for both technologies. 
the advantage of the battery will remain, however. But looking at deforestalization from an overall economic perspective, um, there will be capacity in Europe. So we need additional input. And this means that I will need storage, for first of all. And secondly, wind turbines, solar panels, and so on and so forth also um, have a, a, a higher um, input. So, But currently, the battery is the better option, or it has the better balances. Line. HBO 100, one question came into my mind. It looks so easy, it sounds so easy. Isn't it fancy enough? Why isn't it widely used already? Why we still see more, oh, electricity is hype and hydrogen yeah. is even hyper, so to say? What is your opinion on that? Isn't it fancy enough? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fancy enough, absolutely. Uh, there, there are so many myths uh, about uh, the different kinds of, um, uh, of, uh, of technology. Uh, like one of them is that there is there is not enough uh, of fuel, or if it's too expensive. I think rather uh, that diesel has been too cheap, uh, and it has, has been too cheap to em to emit, and uh, and also. Um, it, it is a scalable solution, and it's the only solution available now. So when when there will be uh, other technologies available, uh, I would be happy to see that industries are using more and more of these technologies. But because honestly, the, the problem that we have, that we have such a huge dependency on fossil resources, uh, it, it's more than the current technology is able to solve. So we need not only this one, not not only electrification, not only hydrogen, but much, much more. Uh, because it, uh, honestly, uh, uh, seeing the uh, latest um, uh, uh, researches about the oil dependency of the world, you can only come halfway with the technology available commercially today. But the dependency is so much uh, bigger than that. I mean, the problem we have, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. It's, not, it's, it's, low, it's really hard to grasp. Uh, so it's not a competition. It's, it's important that this technology is adapted and is being used more and more, and all of it. Thanks, Lene. Moderator sollte irgendwann schweigen, das tut er jetzt, aber steht... So the host should at some point be silent. Uh, this is my moment to be silent, but um, let me now ask the audience, you heard a lot about the fuel cell, um, HVO, and so on and so forth. Do you have any questions at all that you want to ask our speakers now? Um, I asked this question because... Um, we uh, are short on time, and I also want, don't want to deprive you of our cultural end to the session. I would now like to ask Markus Linder to join us on stage. Already during the last uh, 60 minutes, he has collected and gathered everything that you've been saying, and will now sum everything up in his comedic and um, musical way. The floor is yours, Markus. Please stay seated. Please stay seated. Stay here. An der TU Graz hat über die Antriebssysteme referiert. Ich hab dich lieb, Antrieb. Du bringst mich gut voran. Ich hab dich lieb, Antrieb. Wir schauen uns das jetzt an. Er hat von der Emissionsfreiheit gesprochen. Frei, emissionsfrei. Frei will ich sein, völlig emissionsfrei. Und der ganze Saal singt. Frei, emissionsfrei. Dann haben wir natürlich über den Wirkungsgrad gehört. Wirkungsgrad, Wirkungsgrad, robust und nie zu spart. 
Welche Variante hat den besten Wirkungsgrad? Ja, Wirkungsgrad, Wirkungsgrad, robust und nie zu spart. Welche Variante hat den besten Wirkungsgrad? Ein Applaus für Herrn Professor Eichelseter. Liene Norberg, she was talking about renewable fuels. Chain of fuels, renewable fuels. Chain of fuels, 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 fuels. Be biofuels, low carbon intensity solutions. sprach sie über eine Roadmap und die hat mir sehr gut gefallen. On the road again With decarbonization roadmap On the road again Sustainably on the road again With less carbon on the road again Und alle singen On the road again Jetzt wird schwierig. With the carbonization roadmap on the road again. Ein Applaus für Liene Norberg. Die letzte Runde ging ganz schnell und zügig. Johannes Mayer hat Folgendes gesagt. Ein Schiff wird kommen auf dem Zellersee. Geruchlos, farblos, soll der Fuel sein. Ein Braus für Johannes Meyer. <lacht> Herr Volkert aus Oberstdorf, er sagt, natürlich als Kaufmann ist man kritisch, aber trotzdem, es muss schnell gehandelt werden. How long will this be going on? Auf geht's, lasst uns bald sustainable sein. In Oberstdorf und im kleinen Walsertal. Ein Applaus für Herrn Volker. Ja, und Herr Christian Oberwinkler von Kessbohrer. HVO, HVO, darüber sind wir froh, doch ganz fertig ist's noch nicht. Ja, wir schauen und wenn dann alle Beteiligten sind bereit, erst, den, erst dann ist HVO Zeit. Dankeschön. Dear Marcus, thank you very much indeed for this wonderful summary. This brings us to the end of this afternoon session where we focused on fossil fuels and, of course, on sustainable um, tourism. What does the future look like? I would like to extend my gratitude to Lina Folbert, Mr. Folbert, Mr. Professor Telamse. Um, your ships are calling, Mr. Winkler. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for your time. You've given us given us uh, interesting insights into what is happening, what is going to happen, and I think we have a lot of take-home messages that we received today. Enjoy the rest uh, of the afternoon here at the trade fair, and I'll be happy to welcome you back tomorrow for. Um, the innovations in the mountain session number four here in this very room. So enjoy the afternoon. Have a good evening. Thank you. See you soon.